All right, call to order the meeting of the um, Eagle Mountain Community Facilities District Board. Roll call, please. Chairman Schlum? Here. Board Member Contino? Here. Board Member Leger? Here. Board Member Brown? Here. Board Member Hanson? Here. Vice Chair Archambault? Here. And Board Member Dickey is not here yet. All right, thank you. Any uh, one from the public on this? No, Chairman. Thank you. Um, first item is consideration of approving the Eagle Mountain Community Facil Facilities District Board meeting minutes from May 2 21st this year. Can I get a motion? So moved. moved. Second. All right. Any uh, comments on the moment minutes? Anybody in favor? Indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 6 0. All right. Open up the public hearing. Regarding resolution Eagle Mountain Community Facilities District 2009 02, approving the estimates of expenses, tax levies, and the tentative budget as the final budget of the district for the physical the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2009, ending June 30, 2010. We have a presentation on this one, Julie? No, Mayor. All right. Any questions um, on this from the public? No. Any questions from the council on this? It's public session. All right. Close the public hearing and look for a consideration of resolution EMCFD 2009-02 as just presented. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? No public. Are everybody in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Chairman 6-0. Thank you. Uh, and look for a motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Great job on that one. All right. <clears throat> Call to order uh, the meeting of the Cottonwoods Maintenance District Board meeting. Roll call, please. Chairman Schlum? Here. Board Member Contino? Here. Board Member Leger? Here. Vice Chair Archambault? Here. Board Member Hansen? Here. Board Member Brown? Here. And Board Member Dickey is absent yet. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards in for Cottonwoods? No, Chairman. All right. Look for consideration of approving the Cottonwood Maintenance District Board Meeting Minutes from May 2109. Can I get a motion? Move to approve. Second. All right. All right. Any comments? All right. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Chairman 6-0. Thank you. All right. Open the public hearing regarding resolution CMD 2009-02, approving the estimates of the expenses, assessments, and the tentative budget as the final budget of the district for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 09 to June 30, 2010. Julie, anything on this? <coughs> no, Mayor. All right. Thank you. Anyone from the public here? No, Chairman. All right, we'll close the public hearing and look for consideration of resolution CMD 2009-02 as just presented. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. All right, thank you. Any comments? All in favor of resolution CMD 2009-02, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Chairman 6-0. Thank you. And motion to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a, about a seven minute break here and come back and get going at 7.30 or 6.30. That sound good? Yeah. All right. So be ready to go for our special session and regular session at 6.30.
All right, call to order the uh, special session agenda. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for Pastor... Daly from Trinity Lutheran Church. Welcome. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? O Sovereign Lord, why do we seek you at times like this? Why do we pause and ask for your blessing? So many have repudiated you and your reign. So many deny your right to rule. Forgive us, Lord, for our rebellion. Have mercy on us for our arrogance. Look not after our sin, but look upon us instead in your love. For those in our community who are in want, grant your provision. For those who have undertaken dangerous responsibilities, grant your protection. To our elected officials now met in session, grant your wisdom. And to all the members of our community, grant your blessing. All that we have and enjoy is but a special gift from you. Change our hearts that we may receive all good from you with humility and gratitude and that we may join in serving and praising you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Bailey. Roll call, please, Beth. Mayor Schlum. Here. Vice Mayor Archambault. Here. Councilmember Dickey. Here. Councilmember Hansen. Here. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Leger. Here. Councilmember Contino. Here. All right. Thank you very much. A couple of items to report on here. First, uh, a couple of positive uh, things to report on. Uh, as you know, newest Councilmember Dennis Brown joined us a couple of meetings ago and gave up his seat on the uh, as chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission and where he served for a number of years. And uh, in recognition of that, I'd like to ask uh, former uh, Commissioner Brown, now uh, Councilmember Brown, to step down below and I'll present you with a plaque. This way they can see in 3D down here. All right here. Town Council Member Dennis Brown served as Planning and Zoning Commissioner from January 10th, 2002 until his appointment on the Town Council May 7th, 2009. Council Member Brown was a very active commissioner and contributed a lot of time and dedication to various issues brought before the commission that required skill for direction. In the approximate four years Council Member Brown served, as the ch council, the commission's chairperson, he exemplified his decision and leadership skills. Thank you, Councilmember Brown, for all the contributions you've made while serving on this most important commission. And we've got a nice plaque here for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right, just because I didn't bring it down with me, and one more, one more person to recognize uh, down below there <coughs> is uh, Deputy Jeselin here from MCSO. I see him out there. Um, we've got a proclamation here uh, to recognize um, <coughs> Reserve MCSO Deputy Jeselin's service, and I'm going to read it here, and then I'll come down below and and uh, and thank you directly. Uh, Town of Fountain Hills Proclamation. Whereas Jim Jeslin has been a resident of Arizona since June of 1996 and has worked with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office since 1997, and whereas Jim Jeslin first served as a member of the Fountain Hills Sheriff's Posse, and whereas Jim Jeslin then served as a patrol and district detective with MCSO for a period of approximately 10 years, primarily here in Fountain Hills, and whereas Jim Jeslin, following his retirement, now volunteers his time as a uh, to serve as Reserve Deputy for MCSO, and whereas Reserve Deputy Jeslin is alert and vigilant and properly trained to take action whenever necessary, and whereas Reserve Deputy Jeslin has been credited with the recent capture of a serial ro bank robber who is suspected of at least five bank robberies here in the East Valley, and whereas the Town of Fountain Hills recognizes the dedicated service of, re of Reserve Deputy Jeslin, now, therefore, I, J.T. Schlem, Mayor of Town of Fountain Hills, Arizona, do hereby commend Reserve Deputy Jim Jeselin for protecting and serving the residents of Fountain Hills and proclaim the town's appreciation for his extraordinary commitment to law enforcement by continuing to volunteer his time as a Reserve Deputy. They did this 11th day of June, 2009. Please come forward, Deputy Jeselin. Pleasure to see you. And here's your proclamation. We're going to get that uh, to you uh, this week or next week. But I wanted you to take a look at it. Uh, we'll get it to you directly. But uh, appreciate definitely what you've done by staying alert and uh, getting the bad guy there. Was it at the bank itself? or? Yeah, we I watched him uh, get out of the car and then uh, took down the information. And uh, when he came out, uh, we started on 911, calling it in, and went in the bank, made sure everybody was all right. Got more information on him, and uh, Scottsdale was able to apprehend him a couple miles away. So. Well, thank you again for serving us yep. in the past and continuing as a volunteer. And let's get a picture here with Bob. Thank you again. Thank you.
Well, that's kind of fun. Excellent. The next item is a proclamation supporting the Maricopa County Clean Air Make More campaign, as soon as I find it here. Whereas the town of Fountain Hills within Maricopa County feel the effects of poor air quality, as particulate matter in the air is so small it can pass through the throat and nose, under the lungs, and into the bloodstream, as, and as whereas high levels of particulate matter in the air especially impact children, the elderly, and people with heart disease, heart, lung disease, and asthma, and whereas particulate matter causes environmental damage as it settles into the lakes, the soil, upsetting nutrient balances in lakes and streams, depleting nutrients and damages sensitive forests, important farm crops and fragile ecosystems, and whereas under the Federal Clean Air Act, Mar Maricopa County faces federal sanctions and the loss of more than $7 billion in transportation funding um, unless appropriate actions are taken to clear the air, and whereas Maricopa County Board of Supervisors has embarked on an effort to inform community and business leaders, as well as the general public, of the serious challenge before us, um, amongst us, or before us, to stop being part of the problem and to start becoming part of the solution. Now, therefore, I, J.T. Schlum, Mayor of the Town of Fountain Hills, Arizona, hereby proclaim the support of the Town of of the town for Maricopa County Clean Air Make More campaign and urge all town residents to make the clean air commitment by visiting cleanairmakemore.com and signing up to take action through a simple challenge, changes in their everyday lives to protect and enhance the air quality in Maricopa County. Thank you. And now we've got a public appearance by uh, Fred Stevenson from Stantec Infrastructure Management regarding the pavement management analysis. Mr. Ward. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, whilst Fred's setting this up, um, I just want to thank you for this opportunity tonight. Um, as you may recall, uh, we made this report two years ago. It's something that we perform every other year on the analysis of our streets and the conditions and helps us uh, with our, our pavement management process as, as well as um, our different programs for resurfacing streets. So I'll turn it over to Fred. Thanks very much. Thank you. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, uh, Mayor, and uh, Council. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm here today to present uh, basically a summary of findings of the pavement management report that we put together for the Public Works Department uh, uh, late in 2008, uh, early 2009. Uh, the objective of that study was to basically determine the overall performance of the roads network and provide some recommended rehabilitation and maintenance strategies that could be done on these roads to maintain the roads at a acceptable level of service. The approach we took to, uh, to the study is a typical asset management approach. We try to find out or determine what do we have out there, uh, how much is it worth, what condition is it in, uh, what do we need to do to it, when do we need to do to it, uh, and obviously how much money do we need to, to fix everything that we need to do to maintain our roads at an acceptable level. So the first question, I guess, is what do we have out there? Uh, and basically this is the, the road inventory. Uh, what you see here is a table that outlines the various uh, functional classes of your roads and how many miles of roads that you have that meet those functional class criteria. Uh, so, for example, you can see you've got 51%, if you take a look at the, at the part, pie chart there, 51% of your roads are local residential streets. Uh, conversely, though, uh, you've got 49%, almost half your roads are roads uh, from a collector up through arterial, which means these roads are roads that can potentially deteriorate quicker. So half of your network is... Uh, has the capability of deterring faster than your local residential streets and something you should keep in mind. What is it worth? Well, we could take a look at this different ways. Uh, this is the replacement cost. You've got over 30 million square feet of, of pavement out there. Uh, and to replace that at the current unit rate, so the unit rate that we used in 2008 of $4.80, uh, you've got $145 million worth of road assets out there, or you could look at it conversely as a, as a liability against you if you don't maintain those, maintain those roads. So what, uh, so what we did to, uh, to, to figure out what the condition was is we did a detailed survey on the roads. Uh, we split the road network up into three separate uh, survey years, uh, and we, we cycled through that on a three-year basis. Uh, we took a look at cracks, potholes, uh, uh, what else? We, distortions, a lot of different distresses that you can find on the road, as well as the overall ride quality of the roads out there. 
Uh, and those factors combined give us what's called a pavement quality index. Uh, and the pavement quality index is on a 0 to 100 scale. Uh, they can be broken down into excellent, very good, good, fair, depending on what the score is. Uh, the way we work at it here with the, with the city is we define anything over 70 PQI as being adequate and nothing really needs to be done on those or it's not a priority. Uh, and we, we concentrate between the 40 and 70 range. We want to try to maintain those roads an acceptable level and bring them up into the adequate zone. And then obviously anything that's under 40 we need to address as well. So what does a PQI mean visually uh, to you? Uh, PQI greater than 70, that's an example up there of panorama. Uh, I believe, and uh, PQI between 40 and 70, that's over in the Alamosa uh, Sabinas area. And PQI less than 40, that's a Saguaro Boulevard. I'm sure you're all familiar uh, with that. So these pictures give you a little bit of a representation of what the PQI is. <clears throat> and since every single road in the network has been surveyed, within the last three years, we're able to map out uh, what the condition is across the entire network. Uh, this year we found uh, that the average PQI for the network was 67.1. Uh, in 2007, uh, that was 69. So uh, basically we've seen a drop of about two points in the PQI. Is that necessarily a trend? You can't really say that right now. The study is pretty infant. Uh, we've only done this uh, two or three years now, I believe, Tom. So uh, we really can't say if that's, gonna, that's an ongoing trend or not. But it's something to keep in mind. So once we have the condition of our roads, we have to do some sort of strategies on them to, to bring them up to an acceptable level uh, of service. Uh, typical strategies include, include slurry seals, microsurfacing, uh, milling and overlay applications, as well as reconstruction. And it's uh, important to point out the difference in unit rates for these types of strategies. You know, you're looking at an exponentially increasing unit rate. If you let roads deteriorate, it's going to cost you a heck of a lot more money to, to fix them. Uh, you can see here that a slurry seal application is 20 times uh, less expensive than a reconstruct. So how much will it cost? <clears throat> Excuse me. Based on our findings, we found that uh, in 2008 you had a backlog of $9.9 .9 million worth of work. And this included uh, slurry seals, mill and overlay applications, and roads that required some reconstruction. Uh, they are all needs right now, uh, so that's why you, uh, you see uh, no other uh, uh, dollar amounts for mill and overlays and reconstructions in, in the subsequent years because they're all needs right now. Uh, whereas flurry seals can be put off a few years, they're not necessarily needs right away, but we've identified that they're going to be future needs. So in total, over the next 10 years, we've estimated approximately $13 million worth of needs. And in fact, that number could be even higher. Uh, roads that you do maintain or do some work on in years 2008 through 2010, uh, if it's a slurry seal application, the odds are they're going to be required to come back into the, into the program in uh, five or six, seven years later. So realistically, that number is probably pushing uh, $15, million, $15 million over the next, over the next 10 years. Uh, and that's it in a nutshell. I'll take any, any questions that you may... You may have. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Any questions for Mr. Stevenson from Stantec on the pavement management analysis? Yeah. Councilmember Leger. Do you recall um, which street particularly uh, required reconstruction? Uh, for sure, that would include uh, locations on Saguaro Boulevard. Locations on Saguaro. Uh, pretty much, well, pretty much the whole thing of Saguaro Boulevard. There might just be a few little segments here and there, but realistically, the entire the entire road required heavy rehabilitation, if not reconstruction. Okay. It was my understanding, um, Tom, if you could, please. It was my understanding we were looking at mill and overlay for Saguaro versus reconstruction. Are we looking at sections of reconstruction along Saguaro? Mayor and Council, the, um, there are sections that will require reconstruction. Um, the area that Fred showed you on the one photo is down around the golf course, and that is the one of the areas that we were looking at. Um, we've, we've done a windshield inspection of all of Saguaro Boulevard, but we will get into more detailed, um, you know, research once we decide w if we want to go forward mm -hmm. with the bond. You mentioned that the um, the PQI, PQUI, yep, <laughs> is that right? It was less than 40 for Saguaro. Could you interpret that in layman's terms, uh, and uh, how serious is that? 
um, in terms of deterioration if we didn't do anything to it, for example, for two years um, or one year or three year? I mean, how serious is it? Uh, it's, it's pretty serious. Those roads that are at, uh, or those segments that may just be at the 40, or even those roads that might be at the 41, are quickly deteriorating. Um, uh, if you have another wet winter here, it's very possible that what you see out there now could be even worse. So uh, I, I would say that uh, if it was a 40 and you let it go down to a 30, I mean, that's, that could happen basically over, over one year, if not sooner, depending on the, on the type of uh, winter you're going to have. So I don't know if that really answers the question. but it, it, it does. I was just trying to get a sense for how low the peak, uh, PQI needs to go before yeah. it goes to reconstruction. Yeah, well, the PQI2 is, you is, know, it, it's... <coughs> To some degree, it, it's a subjective, subjective. score. Mm -hmm. um, it is based on real data from our, from our surveys, uh, but through the calculation method, I mean, the difference between a 39 and a 41 mm -hmm. uh, isn't, really all that, isn't really all that different. Thanks, but, Vince. Okay. Thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Oh, I'm sorry. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the 2008 figure being uh, 5.7 and 1.2, almost 1.3. Is that all Saguaro Boulevard? Or is it, everything I've heard that was talked about uh, mill and overlay and possibly reconstruction has always been talked towards Saguaro Boulevard. Is that all Saguaro Boulevard, Tom? Or, mm -hmm. or Fred? Either one of you can answer uh, that. No. <clears throat> Maybe I can just go back to that map. Sure. So basically the things in red. Right. Um, what, what Fred is showing you here, Councilman Archambault, is if you oh. look at some of the red areas, you'll, uh, you'll see that it's 0 to 40. But as he indicated, it may be 39. Uh, and then some other areas that are even that are blue could be 42 or 43. So it's, it's very subjective. But we, we do have some heavy areas on Saguaro that are less than 40 um, if, you look, if you follow those lines and look for the red areas on that. I don't know how well you can see that on your screen. So it looks like you got uh, some pretty heavy areas up on, uh, is it TP? Not TP, um, Trevino. Wood? Looks like Trevino's got some heavy areas in it. They're in the blue, 40 to 70. Most of this is, is uh, obviously in the older areas. Also, we had some this year that we slurried down in the south portion of town just north of Shea between Fountain Hills and Saguaro. And we chose to go ahead and, and slurry seal those streets, even though some of the scores that were, were in the upper uh, 30s, uh, we covered them with slurry seal because we felt that that was adequate and it could last a little while longer. Do we have some specific needs that will come up to us uh, in the next budget year? Not, and I'm not talking about the current budget year that we're going to be passing tonight. I'm talking about next budget year, 2010-2011. I know. We're talking about going for a bond issue for Saguaro Boulevard, but I'm wondering if we're going to be looking at bond issues in 2010, 2011 to take care of some of these streets. So we're fastly accumulating some dollars. I could, uh, Mayor and Council, what I can tell you is that the zone that we're looking at for this next fiscal year does not indicate any mill and overlay. It's all strictly type two slurry seal. If you look in that zone, there's only one little small section on Choya there, and that's not in the zone that we're working in. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. Dennis, Contino. Uh, Councilmember Contino. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Tom, have we talked about capping what we're doing? In other words, is there extra money we could put in that bond to take care of a couple of mother? other streets like Fountain Hill Avenue, the fountains, or something like that, it's really deteriorated like Saguaro? Uh, Mayor and Council, we have talked about um, how far, if, if we in fact we have a bond of 4.5 million, how far we can go. Um, it depends upon um, the type of prices that we're getting, the estimates. It's very difficult um, during these times with the uh, volatility of oil and contractors won't give us a price beyond 30 days. So we're looking at trying to do a calculation based on, on what we know today. Um, so we will have to look at Avenue of the Fountains. We are looking at sections of Palisades and some portions of mm -hmm. north end of Fountain Hills Boulevard. But we can certainly look at Avenue of the Fountains as well. Thank you. 
and we'll talk more about that on item 14 for sure. Appreciate any other questions for Mr. Stevenson? Thanks again. Appreciate it. So, Bev, I get to hit the gavel here, huh? All right. Woo. All right, we'll now move into our special session, open the public hearing. Public hearing regarding resolution 2009-17, adopting the tentative budget as the final budget for 2009 and 10, fiscal year budget for the town of Fountain Hills. We have a presentation, Julie, at all? Um, no, Mayor, we're happy here to answer any questions. Hopefully um, the past three or four presentations have been enough information for the public and the council, but we are more than happy to answer any questions the council may have. Thank you. Anyone from the public on this item? No, Mayor. All right. We've had, we've had good dialogue from the public and up here on council. Um, do I take comments here from the council or do I go into the next item from consideration right now? All right. Any comments from council on the during the public hearing here on uh, the resolution 2009-17? The adoption of the budget going from tentative to final for next fiscal year. Comments? Questions? Mayor? Yes, Councilmember Lee. I, I just have a quick question. Last time we discussed the budget, uh, one of the recommendations was to um, move a, a capital project out. Um, Mary, it was uh, number S6046. It was for $100,000. You, you know what I'm speaking about? It was the sidewalks on uh, um, Fountain Hills Boulevard between Crystal Point and Shea. Has that been adjusted? That was adjusted, and the um, appropriations limitation that we sent set a number of sessions ago included that decreased amount. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Let me get to my notes here. Any other questions for staff or discussion on the budget before we close the public hearing? Councilmember Hanson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just had a few things after going through the whole budget process and observing the, the, the budget itself. Um, I did have one question, and this would be for Julie. I know back when we were finalizing our council goals, um, we talked about as part of our analyzing our processes and you know how we can maximize our money about looking at our legal services and whether to continue contracting or looking at going in-house. And I know we budgeted $200,000 for legal services, and I just wanted to check with Julie to see if that she feels that would be an appropriate number for whichever way we went, with whether it be in-house or contract. Um, Mayor Shlomo, Council Person Cassie Hansen, yes, I do believe that it is enough. We are looking and have been reviewing our process for how we incur legal costs, and hoping to um, reduce the cost and the, and the um, amount of time that we require legal services. So we're definitely taking a look at that. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. And then if I just, okay. Um, and I think this is more for the public too that, that starts looking at our budget, budget document. I think it might be helpful. Um, there were a number of changes in this year's budget due to the conversion to the program-based budgeting that presented challenges to the reader and after talking to Julie's staff as well. One of the things that troubled me was the separation of costs associated with a single project. An example would be the strategic planning update. And I knew we'd approved $20,000, but only found 14500 under meetings and conferences. Thinking that they had reduced the amount, I found the remaining $5,000 under printing. And to me, that made it harder to put a finger on the actual cost. And another example was election costs. 78314 appeared in community service contract, while 8000 appeared under printing. And I was worried that we were making it harder to decipher the budget rather than improving our transparency. But that was really alleviated yesterday when I met with Julie and saw the copious amount of detail available for all of the costs associated with projects, services, and functions. And I think now the challenge going forward is to how to present all of that information in a way that will be really clear and forthright to, to all of us laymen. Um, one other idea that we had come up with in talking to Julie was fine-tuning the line item sheets by adding separate line item sheets for the major functions within the larger departments. 
and taking the admin budget, for example, there's so many functions within admin, IT, HR, finance, town manager, legal, town clerk, operations, support, da, 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 da. Um, when all the sub-departments get combined in one line item sheet, it's, it's really overwhelming and it looks huge. And I think separate breakout um, line item sheets would really be helpful. Um, and one other thing, some of the reclassifications made it harder to find the expenditures, such as in the parks and rec budget on the line item page, mowing and landscaping went away and became contractual services. And possibly adding some language in the future, delineating what is included in contractual services might be really helpful. Um, and I can really see where staff really manage these challenges, um, working back and forth between the two types of budgets, and I really commend them on that. Um, now it's just, you know, we know all the information is there. Now it's just how we go forward to present it. And then just one thing, I, I don't want to present any changes before we, we vote on this, but there's just a couple things I'd like to, to just think about going forward in the year. Um, and just things to keep in mind. Maybe consider not spending any funds at all on one-on-ones. Not a big deal, but just something to consider. Consider not spending any money on the website at all and form a committee of the staff and maybe one or two council people to discuss a new user-friendly format and how we can go forward to really improve our website. Um, reduce the four avenue mailings to the first two quarter that would be long enough to prepare people to the switch to electronic transmittal with hard copies in the kiosks. Um, really watch the, the um, money and the economic development budget, which is pretty significant with all the marketing, and just kind of keep that consistent with the economy and try to keep con uh, the census cost at a minimum. And that's all, in a nutshell. Good. The, um, we, can, we can talk about each of those four or five uh, particular items for dollars for this fiscal year, but I'd like your comments on... Um, well, obviously point out the obvious that we all cha were challenged with this year is that conversion and trying to add, draw the lines to each dollar amount as they are broken out quite differently than they have been in the past. But um, I'm wondering, and you've, you've met with staff, so that's good. So, uh, Julie, any thoughts on, um, I know going forward, we, if we maintain the same format now, we'll be able to, to see trending and, and, and see things more clearly than we were this year. Um, but any comments on um, uh, the presentation to the layman comment that uh, Councilmember Hansen made, which was a good one about how to actually understand what's within each of the the, uh, the elements that are now laid out in the budget today? Um, thank you, Mayor. Yes, I appreciate very much the comments by um, Councilperson Hansen and the rest of the council. It was very challenging to try to go from the old line item budgeting now to program budgeting, but I think moving forward in the future, the program budgeting will be give the um, average citizen a clearer picture. For example, um, talking about things like the election, we can actually now show a program for elections with all the costs in it. The same with a strategic plan. Previously, those costs were buried within the administration department. Now we can break out the administration department to the town manager, to the town clerk. We can also break it out down to what's the cost for the strategic plan. So I think our challenge next year going forward, we'll be able to present that information to the public that they can clearly see what the costs of these programs are. And is there any uh, other way you could explain why we went to this new program budgeting? What are, what are the benefits or what was the reasoning for that? Uh, Mayor, um, the biggest advantage is with this new software that we purchase will provide us, we can um, present the budget in line item detail or we can present the budget in program detail. So the level of detail that we can provide to the citizens is much more um, transparent. It will show the true cost of providing a service. So we can show it both ways. We can show it multiple ways. So I think there's a lot of advantages. And as we, you know, it's, we just went live with this on March 1st, so we're still all trying to struggle with trying to get reporting in a way that's very easy for people to, to interpret and to see where our expenses are. So I'm optimistic for the next year. I, I realize it's been a challenge this year. It's been a challenge for all of us. Councilmember Hanson. Mayor, and I think the reason I wanted to bring that out is because I asked Julie yesterday, I said, okay, now when we have our final budget for this year, what will it look like? And she said, it will look like this. And so I think it was important to let the public know that while it might be a little confusing this year, the detail is there. Staff has all the breakdown, and I mean, it's huge. But, um, but this year we still look like this, so there, there might be some questions, and I just wanted to make it real clear that 
you know, staff has done their work and it's all there. It just doesn't quite look like it right now. So will this next year, thank you, will that next year, will it look much different than what we have this year when we come to budget acceptance of 10 and 11? Um, Mayor, definitely we intend to start as soon as this budget is adopted, we're going to start on creating a format that is much easier to read, much easier to go back and compare to prior years so that the council and the public can ex see exactly where their money is going. So definitely we'll, it, we are anticipating a big improvement next year. So the one item that Councilperson Hanson brought up, the strategic plan, being in different locations where the program budgeting benefit is to have it all in one, how does that happen or is that something that will not happen in the future or, or how, how can you speak to that one item? Well, Mayor, for example, of the strategic plan, it's, it's now what we call a program. So whether if we present the budget in a line item detail, you'll see the strategic plan broken up into there's so much um, cost for printing, there's so much cost for, um, I can't remember what the other one is, or alternatively we can show it as here's the Here's the strategic plan budget. So we can show it whatever way is the most clear and the, and the easiest to understand. And, it, and again, we're working through this, so we're, we want to know what is the best way to present it, what is the one easiest to understand. And it's, it's a work in progress. I mean, it's yeah. going to take time. Like she said, they just went live in March and coming up with that magic way to do it. But it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah. A lot of things to code and to, to bring into the right program, I'm sure. But thank you. Um, we'll talk about those other items directly. Uh, Councilmember Contino. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I too want to congratulate Julie and Mary and her staff because I too, like uh, Councilwoman Hanson, had some problems. And Julie was nice enough to say, "Do you want it the old way?" And I said, "No. If I got to learn the new way, let's just learn the new way." So she took time. Mary took time to sit down and explain everything. And I think for what we can do and how we can break this down now, we'll have a lot clearer picture than we've ever had before, and I want to thank them. Good. That's, we sure appreciate it. Thank you. Um, do you uh, Council Member Hanson, do you want to take a look at each um, the uh, website and some of those uh, items directly? I wasn't planning on okay. making any formal motion. It was just kind of putting them out there to keep in mind as the year goes forward. Okay. Very good. Any other comments on the budget? I have to hit the gavel again, don't I, Bev? All right. We have to make a motion, don't we? Not yet. We don't make a motion on the next item. Is that correct? We don't do anything with this one. Close the public hearing and, oh, and look for consideration of resolution 2009-17 as presented. So moved. Second. All right. First, second. Any other discussion? Anyone from public here? No, Mayor. All right. Everyone in favor of? The motion to approve resolution 2009-17 adopting the tentative budget as the final budget for the fiscal year 2009-2010. Indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7-0. All right. Thank you. Look for a motion to adjourn the special session. So move. And Second. And, all right. Do I need a motion actually? To I do. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> we got a motion and a second. All in favor of saying aye. 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 Thank you. Move on to our regular session. Call the regular session to order. Roll call, Beth. Mayor Schlum? Here. Councilmember Dickey? Here. Councilmember Brown? Here. Councilmember Cantino? Here. Councilmember Leger? Here. Vice Mayor Archambault? Here. Councilmember Hansen? Here. Great. Um, any speaker cards here, Beth? Mm. No, Mayor. While you're looking for those, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, consent item number four um, has been removed at the request of the applicant. So we'll have three items on the consent agenda. And also, there are several folks here that are likely wishing to talk about the STS program. And just to be clear, item um, 13 on the agenda is actually the consideration of, um, actually let me ask Julie, getting here. Deputy Town Manager to explain what we're actually going to be speaking to that would be in, uh, similar to uh, or might have the interest of the folks that are in the audience today. Thank you, Mayor. This item is related to the Special Transportation Services Program, but it's not actually the program. What this item is is um, an opportunity. We became aware of an opportunity to get a refund from the Regional Public Transportation Authority 
for funds that we have spent on a program for paratransit. And so before we can apply for this refund, we have to enter into an intergovernmental agreement or an IGA with our PTA to do that. So what it basically is is we have to spend the money for the program and then we can apply to the RPTA for a refund of about $7,000 for that program. All right, and related to the SDS, next, uh, our next council meeting, which I think is July 2nd, uh, what would we likely have coming before us? Uh, Mayor, we're still working on a program um, drafting an agreement with Valley Metro to provide transportation for those citizens who have special needs um, whether it's wheelchair or um, they're non-ambulatory. So we're working with Valley Metro and we will bring forward on July 2nd um, a contract to pr start that program on July 1. Which, for lack of a better term, be a replacement of STS? Yes. All right, and I want to make those comments because um, when we get to item 13, um, if you want to wish to speak to it, it's just on that item, uh, specifically the, um, the RPTA reimbursement. So if you're here to speak to STS, I wanted to welcome you to speak to that uh, at this meeting or come back on July 2nd when uh, it'll be a, an action item before us likely. Um, but if you wish to, during call to the public, you can speak to any item that's not on the agenda as well. So if you came here to speak on that item, uh, feel free to come forward with a speaker card here in the next minute and uh, feel free to speak during the call to the public. Hope that was clear. Anyone from call to the public? I don't see anybody running for speaker cards, so uh, we'll move to the consent agenda. Thank you, Julie, for explaining that. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda, uh, consent agenda um, without that item number four? So moved. Second. All right, first and second. All in favor indicate by saying, or, I'm sorry, roll call. Bev? Councilmember Dickey? Aye. Mayor Schlum? Aye. Councilmember Leger? Aye. Vice Mayor Ashambo? Aye. Council Member Brown? Aye. Council Member Hansen? Aye. Council Member Quintino? <laughs> <laughs> Did he vote twice? We got him. You're from Chicago originally. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Mayor 7 0. All right, thanks a bunch. All right, move to the regular agenda, part of the regular session agenda. Um, number, item number five discussion of the green building design options with possible direction to staff and consideration of appropriating funds not to exceed 60,000 Hunt and, Ca and Caraway Architects Limited to receive the lead design of the possible new fire station. Is Chief LaGreca going to speak on this item? Yes, Mayor. All right. And thank you, Deputy Town Manager Getty, for filling in as Rick's enjoying uh, his scouting week. Enjoying. Hopefully he's surviving. <laughs> Welcome, Chief LaGreca. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, since the last time we met two weeks ago, uh, our world has changed drastically as far as our competition towards this grant that we're all striving to reach. Uh, we've been in hyperdrive probably the last two weeks trying to learn more and more about leads and sustainability. And uh, Chief Roberts has immersed himself in uh, leads and sustainability almost uh, to the extent that it's been his full-time job. Uh, he's not only used our architects, but he's tapped into s uh, citizens in town to help understand this and to uh, help us move forward. Uh, one thing I, I would like to state before I bring Randy up here and make our, our architectural firm available to your comments is these next two items are pretty much all about us being competitive in this process for this grant. The application is very specific on what they are looking for. And both of them that we're going to speak to tonight, and one is the green building lead sustainability piece, which is huge. And again, the, uh, the match piece, which again, they, they mention it four times in there, and then it's also in the application point. So they're saying, yes, you don't need to commit any money, but if you do commit some money, we're going to look upon that favorably. So we'll talk about that a few minutes down the road. But at this point, I'd like to bring Chief Roberts up here and have him tell you what he's learned this past two weeks on leads. And uh, again, we have our team here. Uh, they can answer all your questions uh, from the very simplest to the most in-depth and provide you with a real firm background of the benefits of leads, which has really opened our eyes in the past two weeks. Obviously, uh, I made it pretty obvious 
over the past month that I was somewhat skeptical of, of leads, but uh, we've gotten an education the past two weeks. So without saying any more, Chief, you want to come up? Welcome, Chief Roberts. Thank you. Good, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, if you'll allow me, I'd like to just give a quick kind of recap of uh, how we got to this point. As you'll remember, um, originally about $364,000 were budgeted for the design of this fire station. And of course, that was with the anticipation that we would receive that uh, stimulus, that federal stimulus money. And of course, as you remember, FEMA had released very little information up front and we were just kind of left to guess how this thing was going to go. We knew there was probably going to be some green component to this to this structure that had to be to, to meet the guidelines of uh, the FEMA grant, but we really didn't know the extent of what that would be. So, and we were certainly trying to keep the cost down, as you recall. So we, we you know, we had a price for the, uh, for the green design. We had a price for lead certification. We decided that maybe we didn't need to go that far and we could save some money. So that's what you recall from, uh, from the last time we came before you. And so at that council meeting on June 4th, $114,000 was appropriated to contract with the uh, architectural firm of Hunt and Caraway for the design of the new station for those sustainable features but no certification. And of course they were carefully, carefully selected from over 30 applicants, as you recall, through our RFQ process. And part of that was because of their, their green credentials. Then on uh, June 11th, the FEMA application was released and uh, we had a lot of language on sustainability. There's a huge part in our packet that deals with sustainability. And if you'll allow me, I'll just kind of quickly go through at least the introduction part of that, just to kind of give you an idea of what we, what we ran into. Uh, infrastructure projects must incorporate sustainable practices listed in guiding principles for sustainable new construction and major renovations as required in Executive Order 13423. In addition, infrastructure projects should achieve United States Green Building Council leadership in energy and environmental design, otherwise known as LEED, registration at certified silver, gold, or platinum level. And it says it is important to describe plans to achieve both conditions. So you can see it's more than just LEED. It's actually complying with that pamphlet, too. There's, a, there's qu quite a bit to this sustainability package. And so at that point, what we did is we uh, recontacted our contracted uh, architects and we explained our dilemma and we let them take a look at our packet and we asked them to, to uh, give us a price on a proposal on the addendum to the contract. Because we feel like if we do not have that piece in there, that it's going to be very difficult for us to move forward. This is a very uh, competitive process. We're competing with other cities. You know, there's a lot of parts to this thing, and this uh, sustainability part is really a big deal. And uh, I, I've called FEMA on a couple of occasions just to get absolute confirmation. And just like, you know, when you contact any other federal government officer, they're probably not going to commit themselves completely to anything, but they did say that if, if we don't have that piece, that we'd probably have a very slim chance of, of being successful in the process. So that brings us to this point. Uh, our contracted architect, Hunt and Caraway, has looked at all this information and agreed to incorporate the sustainable design requirements, including that lead certification for an additional $60,000 and $60,010. It sounded like an awful lot of money to us up front, but as we've gone through this the little paradigm shift, learning about all this stuff, it really is a very involved process, and, uh, and the architects are here in the audience, and they'll be welcome to, and, and they'd love to answer any questions you might have regarding the, the sustainability part of this thing. I'd just like to remind you that um, even with, if, if you do agree to appropriate this additional funding, that we will still be well below half of what we originally had budgeted for the design process of the $364,000. So with that, I'll take any questions, or if you'd like to talk to the uh, architects, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk, talk to you as well. Good. Thank you, Randy. Mm -hmm. Anyone from the public on this item? Mayor, we have one speaker. Is it Tom Mazian? He wanted to speak on items five and six. Okay. Excellent. Here he comes. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks. 
sister, I've been watching uh, Channel 11. Now I know everybody. Very good. Speak right into the microphone uh, so they can all know you on have, Channel 11. I have an advantage over everybody here. I live in Fountain Hills, and uh, I do perform certain green tasks and energy modeling, and I also teach the subject. I just wrote something, I'm going to read it fast because there's three minutes here. Importance of energy modeling, because I don't hear this conversation in your conversations, this subject. Performing the energy modeling on a building is the essential part of sustainable design. It verifies the passive design. It paves the road for active solar design. As the architect teams up with energy modeler all possible variations in material use and methodology are evaluated based on the green points as well as payback. Because this method allows you to calculate the payback. So you can make decisions for uh, financing the project and maintenance. And Life cycle costing is the result of all these collaborative efforts. That's it. Do you have any questions? Good. No. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for coming you. forward. <clears throat> any questions for staff? Uh, Councilmember Dickey. Mayor, thank you. I don't have any questions. I do. I would like to speak on this issue. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Mayor and Council, for continuing this item, uh, and that we did not have to make this decision last a uh, couple weeks ago. Uh, part of what we talked about was a piece of paper and how could a piece of paper be $70,000 or now $60,000 and um, I think this might go a little bit to what the gentleman was just speaking about that this particular piece of paper has value just like a college degree or a, uh, a, a permit that we grant a, a builder. It, uh, it says that you've accomplished something that has an accepted universal value to it it guarantees that there's a certain level of quality and, and it's a verifiable standard. Uh, I, I also spoke, I think Randy was uh, um, talking about um, going out there making some calls and you're right, people don't want to totally commit but the people in the know that I know basically said that it's very, very competitive. The review process will check every category and every item. And I absolutely believe, as I did then, that this is, would be very important for us to be considered. I also uh, think that this would have something to do with uh, future scorecard, other state level uh, things that are going on. Talking a little bit about uh, this piece of paper, um, it's really kind of interesting, but over the last week or so, as we've been discussing this, there have been other municipalities who have been starting to uh, and, and other entities that have been starting to do more and more with LEED. Um, I was reading about the Papago Gateway Center that has a LEED Gold standard. After reviewing strict, and this is the way they describe it, the strict environmental practices observed during construction, that's how it was able to gain its gold status. Uh, the folks in charge there say they're proud that they were able to get this gold standard, but we are more proud of how this amazing green building will actually operate in the, wor in the real world, new, healthier, less costly, and they look forward to, uh, I, I like this, I, they look forward to continuing to push through the barrier of present day thinking and technologies. The reason I'm bringing some of this up is because I, I want to go beyond the value of not only the chances that we get to get the funding, and even beyond some of the money that you can save by putting green building in, but some of the other ramifications of it. Uh, basically saving, as I say, money, but also uh, reduces the need for new power plants as we're a growing state, increases the reliability of the energy that we need to sustain this growing state, reduces dependence on oil and natural gas, which is also a, uh, a security issue, reduces emissions of air pollutants that are harming public health, Yesterday, yesterday's, I think, Republic, this, this article about climate change, you know, if you, if you don't want to believe it, it's, you know, it's fine. But I think more and more, I, I hope that people start to take a, a serious look at this and see the sources of these reports and, and not always have such a jaundiced eye on it. Um, it also reduces emissions 
um, I'm sorry, it uh, creates jobs in housing and in new energy. Um, in Arizona, there's a number of municipalities who are, who are champions in lead buildings. Apache Junction, Tucson, of course, Scottsdale. The city of Scottsdale has been cutting edge on the development and implementation of green buildings for a decade longer than, than uh, many of the other municipalities. Um, go back a little bit to money, I wanted to say that I spoke, uh, it's called the Arizona Department of Commerce, and they feel there may be a chance that the, the definition of cost share could include the cost of this, of, of reaching eligible measures. So that's something that we might want to look at. Also, I think some of the talk that we had had to do with, well, how do we budget for this? Um, maybe if we start the, the uh, construction later this year, it could end up going into next fiscal year. But to that point, even if, and we, I know we have contingencies, but I think I sent you all this article about the city of Mesa. Again, very timely, March, June 15th. Uh, Mesa is getting four firehouses for the price of three. Competing in construction companies eager for business during the recession have driven bids down. Cost of building materials has declined, meaning the city will be able to build a fourth station. They've had a tremendous response to their bid process and substantial saving because of the economy. Bids were running at 60% of the anticipated price. So this goes to some of the discussion that we had earlier on before the stimulus funding was even in the picture, which was, do we go forward with this project regardless, not only because of the obvious public safety reasons, but because of the timeliness of this. So I, we don't have to discuss that now, but if we by any chance don't get this, I would hope that this is not off the table. Once again, the, the Republic today said that we cannot go ahead with this we do not have the money for it. And once again, I would correct that. We do, and if this council decides at that point, if unfortunately we don't get the stimulus funding, we would make a value judgment on whether we would go ahead with this project anyway. There's also school districts that are, that are building schools and college, community college districts that are LEED certified, not just green, LEED certified. These schools use 30 to 50 percent less energy, reduce CO2, of course, emissions by 40 percent. They have light and temperature controls. And I think, um, Richard, I think you came to something that I was at where they said that the people that come, there's less absenteeism, people feel healthier. Um, they call it a coveted award. To earn it, what do they do? They use construction materials that it's not only the, the usual uh, idea of solar and energy, but the materials that you use to build come from fairly close by so that you're not trucking it and, and, and having emissions in that way. Low chemical emissions, uh, less of, a, of a, uh, the island effect. Uh, I wanted to mention about public buildings. I know you all have seen this before, but the Department of Environmental Quality where I work is a green building, one of the first, if not the first, lead silk silver certified, which is what we would be. So we live it every day. Um, there was an executive order 2008 that said that uh, public buildings, energy conservation and renewable energy utilization, our building here has already reached that. I anticipate that by going forth like this, we will also find ourselves in, an, in a good position uh, as, as, as all of these codes and these requirements and ability to attract grants uh, get more and more um, abundant here in the state. So I think there was one other thing I wanted to mention about colleges, which was um, the district, Gilbert Community College, they've decided that uh, they were committing to constructing all their new facilities to be LEED uh, Silver certified. And again, there's cost savings that we can look up I think there's a couple questions about whether if we design this now, how long will it last? And I imagine that the uh, architects can take a look at that. But again, I do want to go beyond the idea of how much we're saving and whether we can get the stimulus funds to say that I think this is um, a very wise decision and I hope that we can go forward with it. Thank you. Any other comments from council or questions for staff? or chiefs? Yeah. Councilmember Leger. Either, either chief would be fine. Chiefs. Randy. The chiefs. The chiefs. chiefs. <laughs> We're all the Indians. Yeah. 
Randy, I know uh, when you spoke and when the chief spoke, um, you, you clarified that uh, things changed rapidly. And, and just for the benefit of the public, because as you may recall in our last council meeting, um, the LEED certification uh, was a nice thing to do with respect to increasing the probability of obtaining the grant as well as the match. Now what I'm hearing today uh, in reading in the staff report, it says must incorporate lead practices, and it also says must achieve uh, registration for lead. So that's, we've kind of come 180 degrees since our last meeting. That might create some confusion for the public, especially if they caught last, uh, the meeting two weeks ago and they happened to miss this one. What, what changed? And I just wanted you to reiterate once again that and for for my um, for my not specifically for my sake, but people are already asking these types of questions, is that you, we've had an opportunity to drill down the last two weeks and discovered that what we thought was a nice thing to do to qualify for the grant now has been stated as more of a requirement than a nice thing to do. Is that an accurate statement, uh, Mayor and Council Member Leger? Just just to clarify some of the language here, the must incorporate is that guiding principles. Mm -hmm. that, that pamphlet that comes from the federal government, okay. and that's and that's part of this proposal. The the lead part of it is a should achieve lead registration at one of those levels certified up through platinum, but it also says it's important to describe plans to achieve both conditions. And then throughout the rest of the document, it continues to to mention the lead thing. But there was just a little bit of confusion on our part where it said the should achieve. And that's why the calls to FEMA, where they pretty much, without absolutely saying that it was a have to have to have, that that we would not have much of a prayer in, in the uh, yeah. competition for the for the grant. Yeah, and, and once again, Mayor, uh, I'm not questioning your your data. I just want to cl clear the air that we've come we've come 180 degrees in this discussion since the two weeks, and I just want people to understand if we move in this direction, uh, the rationale for for moving in this direction. Certainly. And if I may clarify one other issue quickly, um, in our uh, call to the public there, we had a gentleman come up and talk about uh, the energy modeling. And if you'll, in our, in our scope of work here and the proposal for the $60,000, energy modeling is included in that as well. I just want to make sure we know. Very good. Okay. Chief, I, Mayor, I think Chief wanted to add something to that, if you don't mind. We might like to add one more thing on to what Randy had said in, in regards to your question. You know, this application is a three-part process when you submit. And, you know, and once we push the button to submit on July 10th, there's no taking anything back. You're in. And so you try to get through the pre-screen right away, and I feel very confident that that's not even going to be an issue for us if we're successful and doing everything that we want to do, including these two things tonight. Then we go into peer review, and then that's a committee of our peers, primarily firefighters or somebody in, in that business, we will go through and look at that 20-some page application and determine, are you an acceptable building to move forward? And if you are, then you go into technical review, and they'll send those people another package to fill out in technical review and you look at technical review and the two spreadsheets that they give you and it's all leads. So if you go into technical review, if you even make it to technical review without leads, as soon as you get in technical re review with no leads, you're done because half your spreadsheet can't even be filled out. So uh, they could have very easily just put in big red letters in there you must, but for some reason they felt that they didn't totally need to use that word, but the handwriting is, is clear as a bell. If you get the technical review and you don't have leads, it's over with. My sus I suspect leads is not a federal um, program, isn't it? An organization of professionals? Mr. Mayor, that's correct. So they're probably not looking to endorse any particular organization, I would suspect. That's probably their thinking. Okay. Vice Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, Julie, um, the number we heard was $60,010. Would, would we need to amend uh, this particular risk analysis or this motion that we have in front of us? Uh, Mayor, some Vice Mayor Archibald, um, no, we would, we have 
funds appropriated in the capital project fund for the fire station, the 1.5, the 60,000, if the council approved it, would have to come out of that appropriation. So we wouldn't have to make a budget change. The difference is that the 1.5 had a revenue source attached to it, meaning the stimulus funding, whereas the 60,000 doesn't. But there is an appropriation there. We wouldn't have to amend it. We would just be taking it out of that 1.5. And um, would we be taking, we have this year budgeted $364,000, we have approved $114,000, would we be taking the $60,000 out of this year's appropriation? Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, no, it will be come out of next year's budget. It, so it will come out of that $1.5 million? Correct. Would any matching, when we get into the matching funds, would that be coming out of there too? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's a question I've got on the timing and the, the reimbursement and in line of all of our budget discussion talking about savings on the project and the in a, maybe in an approach like the program budgeting that we talked about. But on the timing, um, you mentioned the spreadsheet that needs to be populated. Is, is that spreadsheet populated by the numbers that are acquired through funding and architect to uh, come up with those numbers? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, the spreadsheet I was talking about was the sustainability spreadsheet. So it has no cost involved into that. It's just what you're proposing to accomplish in your sustainability goals, what level of lead you're shooting for, and how do you expect to get there. So that spreadsheet that we were talking about was purely a sustainability spreadsheet. That was under, their, un, under the impression that obviously there would be need to be a, a design to reach a LEEDS certification, you know, planned out before you start um, moving dirt and, and so on. But when are this, when would the $60,000 need to be spent? Uh, would it not need to be spent um, once we decide to move forward on the project, or does it need to be enveloped within the entire design? Uh, from what I understand, it would be, it would be staged, but could I ask a, our architect to come up and explain that? In more detail? Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, so Mayor, the, council members. And the question is when do you need the money? Um, we uh, understand there's the certification process uh, has a lot of uh, different elements to it. How many are involved in the actual architectural upfront, the part that we're currently contracted with you now? If you are taking a building that is going to be LEED certified and sustainable. You have to start doing that at the very beginning of the project. We are at a conceptual design stage right now. We are literally ready to submit site plan review to the city for review. If that is approved and we take the next step, that starts detailing, calculating the building, and that is when it is necessary. Thank you. So after the concept review That's stage, right. which is basically where you are today. That's right. Okay. Um, any other comments on that timing? Uh, uh, question Member Brown. architect, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Do you fill out the uh, sustainability forms for us? Yes. We, uh, we ha I have here with me tonight our project manager for the project and uh, Gustavo and Jonathan Smith, who is our lead AP, or PA, AP. Uh, he is the one that is approved and does the form work. All of that is done online. Uh, it is an immense amount of work to fill those out, and yes, we do it. That's all included as part of it. We've got a stack of notebooks under Gustavo's <laughs> chair there, about this thick, for the one, the one project up at uh, Camp Navajo Fire Station, which is just completed. And uh, we thought if you wanted to see how much paper there is in it, we've got the paper. So in what I'm hearing you say is the, the $60,010 will, will also include all of the paperwork through all of the construction because it has to be documented very clearly during the course of construction. And then I, it's my understanding for maybe a year and a half after it's constructed, it's monitored and reports still are filed? There, are monitor, there is monitoring, and yes, it does continue through construction. That is the certification process, 
and that is included in our fee. Thank you very much. Councilmember yeah. Well, We have the architect in front of us. This is kind of a, a technical question, but I think it kind of dovetails into what uh, Councilman Brown was just, just addressing. Um, kind of a academic theoretical question. If, in fact, we move with 60,000 um, to move towards the LEED uh, certification registration, and we, as you stated, as you're designing, this process is working, and there's part of it moves all the way through building and construct, construction. What if we don't get the grant, and what if we decide not to build the fire station? What do we get for our money? Will the design be, which will be completed, because we've, we've, we're comping you for that, will that design then be LEED certified, registered? Because we're coming short of the construction, which is what I'm hearing you say necessary to encompass certification and registration. The construction documents that we would complete uh, will be reviewed and will have a certain number of lead points to become certified, but they are not certified until they are actually constructed. Okay. So drawings are not. The building itself is. Part of that fee does take the construction, the certification of it, and that happens during the construction process. That is the one big advantage to LEED. We can design a green building and you don't know if it's really going to meet that or not, but the certification process actually monitors all of the equipment that's put into it. It tests it, it runs it, and it certifies that what the manufacturer has told us it will do, that it does. However, in the and event until that... Until you get that, you're not certified. Okay. So if we do not engage in construction, then we don't... We're, are we going to be reimbursed for part of these fees because we don't go into construction, or how well, does that part work? Of our, part of our fee is for that certification process, and if you do not build it and we do not do the certification, you will not be charged for that portion of it. That answers my question. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And that's where I was going on the timing. Um, we'll be filing July 10th, so we'll be at the concept review stage. We won't necessarily need to move beyond that until we hear back on this grant. Is that what I understand? Or would there be any reason to move forward beyond that? As uh, Mr. Mayor, as the architect said, we are ready, and I think they're applying to P&Z to go for concept review uh, within the next two or three weeks, whenever they meet again or whenever they uh, supply us that date for that review process. When uh, that process is approved, hopefully so at that meeting, I assume that's when the architects will start doing the actual design work, the actual site work of the building and the design of the building and then they'll only be able to go so far and then that's, that's it. And when will we expect to hear back from uh, the, the feds on, the, on our success? They're saying September 30th. Oh, so fairly quickly, turn, quick turnaround. It seems like uh, the timing it would be prudent to have, if, as long as we are at a point uh, that we're submitting that we think we have success and, and mentioning that we're going to go for a lead since it sounds like a must rather than a should, um, that you don't expend the monies to actually do the lead certification or to go much further uh, down that road until you actually are awarded the project. Or if we are not awarded the project and we have a discussion to move forward anyways, that, that, that we then decide whether we want to spend the money on that or not. Uh, Mr. Mayor also, and Andrew can verify this, but I believe their contract states that they bill on a monthly cycle for only the work that's been performed and completed. So you're not writing them a check for $114,000 and now we're going to write them another check for $60,000. Uh, they're billing for the work completed. Is that correct, Andrew? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Chief, uh, that's correct. The, the contract amounts that we write are not to exceed amounts, so it's hourly against that rate not to exceed the cap that the council approved. So if, for instance, we were to amend the contract to include 
an additional $60,000, and part of that was the upfront design and part of it was the commissioning at the end. The upfront would be spent as it's charged along the way. The, the tail end portion, which I believe is a smaller portion, would never be expended until such time as you actually constructed the building. So you can authorize up to a certain amount without actually expending that amount. Mm -hmm. It just seems um, on the timing portion that um, uh, discussing, I mean, I think most council wants to have a building that's, ever, ever, you know, sensitive to the environment and if it's leads, it's leads. Um, but but uh, authorizing expenditures that um, it seems a little preliminary, then it seems like we would want to have the project funded by the stimulus with our next agenda item probably agreed to, um, and then authorize the spending. But if we authorize this or, or move on this motion that's suggested tonight, I would I would want to make sure it's pretty clear that we're not spending any of that certification dollars until we have another discussion following our successful uh, awarding of the of the stimulus dollars or or not. It just seems like the time you know I I don't want to spend sixty thousand extra dollars on designing something that we may not end up building uh, because there's that chance. Uh, we've already approved a hundred and some thousand dollars for the design. Of course we'll we're doing spending that incrementally based on how far we go, which is good. Uh, but this is just another part of that I don't want to um, spend before we have to. Any other comments on timing? Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yes, Council Member Brown. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I I take a little different look at, at what you're referring to. I uh, I see that we probably need to go ahead and and approve the sixty thousand dollars. It it is a it is a it's not as if we're going to write them a check for sixty thousand dollars, but if we don't start the process of the design for a sustainable building, they won't be able to fill out the proper paperwork if we get to phase three of the, um, of, the of the loan package. So, and and then the the other part of that is, if we do is hypothetically, if we design a sustainable building, and we don't get the funding to build it, we can still we still have the right to build a certifiable building without having it certified. Mm -hmm. And that would be the right thing to do. Even if we don't go ahead and spend the balance of the $60,000 to, quote, get it certified, we have these plans and the specifications to build a certifiable building, even though it won't be certified. And for the little bit that we're talking about doing, I see it as a, a, a fairly big gamble not proceeding and because if we don't proceed, the chances of not getting the grant is huge. Mm -hmm. So I, I would have to say we need to go ahead and improve the 60000 so we can keep the process going as it should, as it should flow for the grant. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, just a point of information. Uh, the commissioning part, which would be the part that would not be spent if we decided to uh, wait to build the building, would be $22,000. So the other 38000 would be involved into getting to the point that uh, Commissioner, uh, excuse me, Council Member uh, uh, Brown just had mentioned. All right. So that, that my first question was about that spreadsheet that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily needing leads work done. It, that didn't sound like, uh, or did it? Um, but how, how, so basically how much would we have to spend um, until September. Uh, I mean, is there really thirty-eight some thousand dollars worth of uh, work being done between you know first part of July and and through August and in or in filling out the paperwork to submit for this you know through technical review and all these different reviews? If I could, Mr. Mayor, uh, refer to our architect because you know I don't know the scope and the pace of their work. So over the next two months, what what amount of dollars in this leads funding would we need to expend with? You know, I cannot identify the exact amount. Uh, we didn't break it down that way. What will have to be done, however, 
is to get it on the list to get the initial forms filled out. I'm sure that when you put your application in, <coughs> pardon me, and you say it's going to be leads, they're going to go to uh, lead, look at the, see if you've got a registration number on it that says we're going that way. Is that right, John? Okay. Okay. So, you know, at least it's got to go that far because then they're going to say, okay, they've applied for it. Mm -hmm. So we've got to get the initial application on. Okay. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, so what you're basically telling us is we basically have to complete the plans and spend that $38,000 uh, before we actually find out whether we're going to have the grant. Is that correct? If I'm reading that right, I'm thinking you have to move forward with the plans in order to fill out some of that paperwork that you have to submit to lead and get or submit to the grant and then get to the different levels. And by the time you're at the level where they're going to be awarding grants, we almost have to have a complete set of prints, don't we? That that pretty close to it. That's right. One of the first things you do, though, is you make your application. You get a a number that is yours that you start putting the building into. It doesn't all go in. You do not fill out all of the lead forms at one time. They come very spaced out. And so we need to at least get that started. And how fast we move on it or how slow we move on it uh, is really dependent upon you. Thank you. I've mentioned um, in, your in the introduction you read was that it should be silver with a description uh, and also the green plan needs to be described. Um, is that part of the LEADS work or is that part of the work that you already do being a LEADS or a green architect? Is that something that you would already expect to be doing or would that only be done with this additional funding? It would, it would be done with the additional funding. Now when I make a statement that we design green, uh, we design buildings that are sustainable. We design buildings that have uh, cost-effective uh, operating systems, all of these things. What LEED does is to certify it, and LEED approves it. And, uh, you know, I can, I can design a very cost-effective green building, but there's nothing to prove that it is. And that's what LEED is all about. Uh, we've, uh, you know, made a statement here that, uh, and, and Gustavo wrote for me a definition of green and lead this afternoon, and I, it says here, the incorporation of recycled materials, environmentally friendly products, energy efficient systems, water saving technologies, and sustainable design with the goal to create a renewable system without external input is green. Now LEED is the documentation and verify, verification of any green systems both within the design and during the construction process. Ben, in other words, we're trying to conserve our green too. That's where I'm coming from and <laughs> the timing is <laughs> good. Mayor. Mayor. Council Member Dickey. Well, just follow on those lines. Uh, I had a little talk with Mike after the last meeting, and I said, well, you know, I understand what we're talking about with the certification, but it's like if you stand in the back of the room at college, but you don't participate, you don't get a degree. It means something to be certified. When we give somebody a building permit, if they're going to put a porch on their house or a roof on their house, it means something, and that's I guess that's what I'm just trying to say. This is verifiable, universally accepted. And that's why I, I think that that's probably why the the grant is looking for us to have it. Councilmember Hanson, thank you. Thank you. First, I just want to thank the citizens that have contacted us with the information. We have one that's becoming certified lead, a lead AP who is willing to volunteer his time along with our staff to do this process. After hearing the amount of paperwork there is and seeing evidence of it, it's clear that we probably really could not do that in-house. And that being said, I think it's time to move forward with this. Yeah. And I guess I'd make a motion to that. I'm sorry, Dennis. Go ahead. That's all right. Uh, I'm concerned about the green aspect of it. Um, I know that everything has to be taken care of and certified and everything to be green, but 
I'm more or less concerned about the design of this building, and I haven't seen anything that shows me how green this building is. It includes the lumber, it includes the fiberglass, all the insulation, the windows, how it's set according to how the wet the wind is, or not the wind, but the weather is, the sun, morning, night, all the glass, the whole works, everything. I haven't seen nothing on this yet, and I'm very concerned when you say green, we could be making it all with recycled materials and still not be a green building. We haven't seen everything yet, and as far as going green, I'm a green person. But you can't tell me that this is going to be what we want right now, and I haven't seen anything of a building or anything or in infrastructure on this design to say this is a green building like we want. Thank you. I think that's, um, I mean, everybody could take, uh, could require different uh, information to get comfortable with. Uh, their we're going ahead on something that I'm, I'm sitting back saying we're moving into this and we're supposed to have a green building and I'm, I'm sitting back saying where? Does, would the LEED certification give you, do you understand enough about that to be confident in that giving you a comfort level that this property would be built? No, because I don't know how the design is and if it has to be tilted one way, a degree, two degrees, or what it has to be to make this build this right for a green building. This is the thing I'm looking at right now, and I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that. I'm kind of concerned about the heat factors in certain parts of the building and how they lay everything in and what they're doing, and I, did, I just don't know all that yet. Maybe and I think that's a part of the green process. When would we start to see some of that information? Uh, is that at the project review? Thanks, Chief. Um, or is that through this leads process? Yeah, Mayor and Councilman Contino, um, the uh, the lead really is about the only accepted standard right now for for green buildings. That's about the only way that you can absolutely guarantee that all those things that you discussed will be green, and that that's why it needs to start at the very beginning. I mean, we are at a kind of a crossroads here that we really can't push forward at all with this design until we, we decide which way we're going to go with this thing. But I, but I think that your, your concerns are very well taken, and I do think that having this LEED standard really will take care of those, all those issues that you've discussed. And uh, Gustavo, who is our, our architect, I think he could probably you know, put some of these things to rest if we could just uh, take a moment to, to listen to him, if you don't mind. Sure. Welcome, Gustavo. Some of those things that Councilmember Contino stated are those addressed through the LEED certification process? Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Council Members. Yes, the answer is yes. And you're looking for a set of eyes to make sure that our building will be sustainable. LEED is your guy. This is basically the only organization that will make sure that all the different credits that we go for uh, concerning orientation of the building um, windows, how many facing east and west, uh, how it sits on the site, how much water we retain on the site, all those items will be addressed going through LEED. Um, now we, we do have a conceptual floor plan, site plan and elevations um, for anybody to review and when we submit those for council review I think it's, they become public records so anybody can look at them. Um, and basically we're at the time that once we implement lead into our, our project and you vote yes on this item is when it really will start to see all those things happening to the building, basically. Thank you. So maybe it wouldn't be bad when, when it's appropriate to get a set of those plans or uh, electronic version to the council, particularly. Um, but that gets back to the timing. Um, I know this is an application that's just come out and then you're not sure what will be coming out once we get past this first step and get into the technical review, at past the peer review. I suspect what you're we're filling out for July 10th submission would be all that's needed for the peer review. Is that what, would, what you suspect as well? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that's totally correct. Okay. That's true. So that there we'll just be making a statement that uh, we will be meeting at least a minimum of a silver lead certification as long with the, the green language that's, that's uh, That's correct, and then it will become much more definitive in the technical review phase. And, uh, and they're very clear in the application process that once you say or commit to what you're going to do, they're going to hold you to it. 
and should you deviate from what you say or what you're going to do, uh, uh, you stand a good chance of losing the grant and probably me could end up in front of uh, the inspector general, whoever, whoever this person is, but they mention them in there several times. So uh, there's a there's a bit of risk on my part too as we go forward that if we commit to something and we uh, don't do it through the process, uh, we could lose the grant if in fact we did get the grant. So uh, you know they're they're pretty much holding us to our word. Uh, they're not asking for a lot of empirical data. They're not asking for reams and, and uh, sheets of paper to show what we're doing. Uh, but there will come a time that we'll, we will have to produce that to uh, FEMA. Sure. Uh, and uh, so this is just more than me talking or anything. And, uh, and another critical part of, of LEADS, which I just didn't understand, is that, you know, one of the main reasons why you go for something higher than just a certification because as the architect said as we go through the process there's a fair chance that you could lose four or five points so if you just went to for lead certification and in the process you lost three or four points you drop below certification you lose the money that you spent to get to that point is now out the window so you always shoot up for a couple of levels above and then in that way if you do happen to miss a couple of your your benchmarks you know, you're still going to come in at a silver level or certified at worst thank you that's a, the timing's what i'm drilling down on i don't know everything like you've learned through and gustavo knows all about leads and, and others um, it's obviously important to us we're talking about it because it's important to qualify for the monies absolutely and, um, whether LEADS is the, the best program or it's, it's what they're looking for. So that's why we're talking about it. But if we, if we could expend as little towards that as we need to at this time until we need to talk again, whether we're successful in get, garnering the monies or if we have to consider spending it um, ourselves. I, I just would like to have that opportunity to spend as little as possible. Uh, absolutely. And again, I, you know, you know if, if you do approve this tonight, uh, you know, I think that sets us on the path regardless if we get the grant or you decide to build the station a year or two years down the road uh, pretty much what you're going to say tonight and what we're going to put in motion is that this is going to be a LEED certified building. Thank you. Councilmember Dickey. Just a question I forgot. How much, how many square, what's the square footage of the uh, building? 5,800 square feet. I'm sorry? Tentatively 5,800 square feet at this time. Okay, thanks. And are there some uh, quantitative figures either from the past or expected on this project uh, that would have a program budgeting type of a factor on this building itself by being LEED certified? Would it save on some components and some of the earthwork and some of the uh, components within the property? Would we get a payback you know, directly from this LEED certification or does it do the opposite? Does it cost more to build a LEED certified building. We'll let our LEEDS expert uh, answer that question okay. if you will. Thank you. LEED, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Jonathan Schmidt. I'm a LEED, a LEED AP for uh, Hunt Carry Architects. Um, to answer your question, there are certain credits. Um, we've actually indicated some of the different credits. For example, energy efficiency, I think we're crediting 24% to save um, energy within the facility. Water consumption, we're still determining from the fixture, things like that. But once we actually get into the lead credits, we'll understand how much energy and, and water and different things we'll save. How about the actual you know, work that's on the land, the prep, and the actual construction, the components that go in? Are there any savings there? It, it really depends. Sometimes there's actually a premium to those prices. Um, for example, if you put a structure underground or anything like that to help with insulation values, you're going to have to pay more money to do that. Um, recycled materials, you'll save some money in some areas, but you also will spend some money in different areas. So it, it comes out to basically a wash. Okay. Mayor. Councilmember Cantino. Yes, I, I guess the one thing I looked at when I was looking at, at uh, what we're trying to decide tonight on the green aspect of it is that there's a possibility we could take and put the fir uh, first floor underground and have a second floor and double our space. And that's why I'm wondering with the, the certain amount of measurements we have on that site, 
according to what everybody's telling me, it's a tight fit to get that in there. Uh, we don't have much wiggle room. So we could go green with two stories as well as just one and, stuff and have a lot more uh, efficiency and more green than we had before. This is why I'm saying, are we rushing everything or have we looked at the second floor or an underground floor and have a, a level floor underneath there just like we got now? Have the project manager, uh, or you, you may not be familiar with that, if that was considered. Yeah, I can turn it over to Gustavo. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and Council. We uh, were not requested uh, to um, explore a second story or two level uh, fire station. If the fire department feels it's adequate to do so, uh, we'll be willing to do uh, just that. Um, there's other issues that uh, I'm sure Peter Johnson here in the room can address as far as ADA accessibility and implementing elevators and things that go into a two story bu public building that normally you wouldn't have in a residence. So, um, and not necessarily it would mean greener building or more lead efficient going two story than going single story. Um, the solution we have provided thus far, uh, as far as the site plan and locating the, the building within the site is very successful addressing all the code issues, zoning ordinances, and uh, lead items as well. Well, if you've got two stories, couldn't you feel better about the building than you would if you just had one story? If you could make it two stories and make it more efficient and sustainable design for what you got rather than to sit back and just make one story on it. And because I'm, I'm concerned about the, the size of the lot that it's going to be put on. And this has been brought up to us more than once. It's a, really a tight fit to put that in there. So when we do that and we look at all the green aspects of it, are we really looking at all the aspects of a first floor and a second floor underground that could be utilized and taken care of? Our experience uh, tells us that a second uh, two-story building is not necessarily greener than a single-story building. Uh, we, we're willing to listen to any ideas or insight you may provide uh, on a two-story building. Well, I think, too, on your first story and second story, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have that, that concrete in there and that barrier that you have, it's an insulation barrier that you can do back and forth, and you can insulate your walls underneath on the first floor, so it would be part of a green building. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that is, you're not wrong. You're correct. Uh, and underground buildings uh, sometimes uh, provide better insulation value, but present other challenges that, in the long run, may present additional expenses to a public building. Okay. Thank you. And um, yeah, we've got a speaker that has to come up, so let's take a public. Just yes, I'm sorry, Councilman Manson. Just to the two stories, I'd have concern with that because that's going to double the impact to the resort property. It, it would be even bigger. The visibility. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have someone from the public who wish to speak? Cynthia Zagurski. Thank you. Welcome, Cynthia. It's going to be big. I attended the meeting that um, where they presented the plans and the elevation drawings. And the biggest concern that I have is that I feel like we're kind of putting the cart before the horse. And all of a sudden, here we are. It feels like we're building a fire station on this little tiny piece of property um, on a very busy uphill grade in a neighborhood situation where it's all homes around the area. And we haven't actually expected anything different than to just plop this building on top of this surface. And I think he's right in terms of if we considered a two-story property or building so that it was built down uh, below grade, like what Fry's has done and what also the hotel property people have, have proposed for their property, that it would be a little bit better environmentally. But having said all of that, I don't understand why we really feel like that is the best place. I think that when they did their study, you know, and came up with statistics and you pinpoint okay, here's the perfect spot for this. I think there's a lot of other issues that we need to address. And I, I'm afraid that, you know, here we are looking for grant money and we feel pressured to get this grant money, but we need to really look at a lot of other things before we move forward. Thank you, Ms. Kirsten. So many of those, um, it sounds like you're familiar with many of the items that were that we talked about before about placement of this facility and that 
has been over a year of discussion on that. Um, that we, and that was a big, probably one of the biggest items to uh, come to some level of comfort with for most of the folks on council. The, um, any other thoughts on this item, number five? Do we have a motion yet? We don't have a motion yet. I think Council Member Dickey was about to make one. Okay. Or Kathy Hans, Council Member Hanson. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm looking at you. But, um, the wrong that name. being said, I did vote against the original contract because I do agree that I feel that there is a better location. But that being said, the decision's been made what the location is going to be. So I'd make a motion to approve. I'm finding it here. Page uh, 51. Five hours. There it is. I had to scroll down. Mm -hmm. Approving, uh, approve the town appropriating funds not to exceed $60,000 to Hunt and Caraway Architects to comply with sustainable practices and the guiding principles of sustainable new construction as required in Executive Order 13423 and achieve lead registration as silver certification as required by the FSC grant application. No, I'll second that. All right. First, second, any discussion on the motion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7-0. Thank you. We'll make up time on this next one. Item number six, discussion and consideration of possible town matching funds not to exceed 10% relating to the 2009 assistance to firefighters grant for construction of the possible new fire station. Chief LaGreca. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, as stated before, there's another stipulation in there that even though this grant does not require a match, uh, they look highly on any organization that is willing to uh, partner in this uh, process. Uh, so our recommendation tonight is, is that you approve uh, a potential 10% match of the grant. Uh, as you realize, if we are unsuccessful in the grant, then this becomes a moot point. Thank you. Anyone from the public on this, Bill? Mr. Tasmanian? Mr. Tasmanian, did you want to speak? Will your same comments apply to this item, or would you like to make new additional comments? Can I live in the... You would speak in the micro microphone. In Valicito Drive. And uh, I've been following this procedure and I uh, I enjoyed the fact that everybody here was uh, really digging down and, and trying to understand the issues and I think you understand understood the issues uh, the reason we're going lead I understand is because uh, it's a requirement and energy modeling is also required by for any grant and I actually have a copy of another This is your tribal. Thank you. It's almost the same. They are required lead. And uh, I just want to say, as a semi-expert in this field, uh, I feel very comfortable with your vote. Thank you very much. I congratulate everybody. Thank you for coming again. All right. Any uh, discussion on this item? We'd look to get a motion to approve the matching funds not to exceed 10% for application to the, the assistance to firefighters, firefighters fire station construction grant. So moved. How about a second? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7-0. Thank you. Next item is public hearing related to Ordinance 09-06, Amended Fountainville Zoning Ordinance Chapter 6, Sign Regulations to eliminate the requirement that an A-frame sign be located within 20 feet of the main building entrance and to increase the signage allowed for large commercial buildings. Mr. Turner. Mayor Shalom and members of the Council. Uh, these two changes to the sign regulations come to you having taken slightly uh, different paths. Uh, the change to the A-frame sign regulations started with comments made at a call to the public uh, last December. 
the local business owner stated that due to the 20-foot uh, distance requirement, he could not legally place an A-frame sign where it could be seen from the street. Um, at the conclusion of the call of the public, the mayor indicated that this issue would be looked at further by the staff. Uh, the other sign regulation change would allow larger commercial uh, buildings to have more signage. Um, that began at a Board of Adjustment hearing on a variance request for the sign for the new Bashes store. During the discussion, at least two members of the Board of Adjustment commented that the zoning ordinance should be changed to allow larger stores to have more signage. Uh, both proposed changes have been reviewed by the Planning and Zoning Commission Subcommittee on Signs and by the Town Attorney and have been recommended for approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Eliminating the requirement that an A-frame sign be located within 20 feet of the uh, main building entrance will be accomplished by striking one of the sections in the sign regulations. Uh, removing this restriction uh, will have the effect of increasing the visibility of businesses and business promotions. The total number of A-frame signs will not increase. However, it may appear that there are more A-frame signs because more signs will be able to be located closer to the street. With regard to the other change, the existing sign uh, regulations put a 100 square foot cap on the total amount of signage allowed for a commercial business. Uh, using the new ratio adopted with the recent change to the sign regulations, this limit is reached for a store with 50 feet of building frontage. We studied the question of allowing larger commercial buildings to have more signage and I believe the best way to accomplish that is to uh, permit additional signage at a ratio of half a square foot of additional sign area for every foot of building frontage in excess of 100 feet. And I, if I could go to I cut just a couple of slides to illustrate the changes that we're talking about this evening. This first one is uh, illustrates the change to the A-frame sign regulations. This small area here in front of this business here would be the current allowed area for an A-frame sign. That's approximately 20 feet around the, the main entrance. With the proposed change, anywhere on this site is possible a location for uh, an A-frame sign, provided it's not in the parking lot and not in the street uh, right away. This next uh, slide illustrates the existing regulations with regard to um, the aggregate sign area for a business. The, the top example, this is a 50-foot wide storefront, and in this situation, uh, the maximum allowed signage is 100 square feet. That's the same allowed signage even though you have a building with 200 foot wide uh, frontage. So there's no increase in, in sign area even though you um, uh, more than double the, the frontage of a business. This illustrates the proposed change. The topic again is the same 50 foot wide storefront it's the same uh, total allowed square footage. That's not changing. What is changing is down here, where now for that same 200 foot wide storefront, you're allowed 150 foot of signage, which is 50 square feet more signage, more in proportion to the size of the building. And uh, um, Mayor Schlamm, that concludes my report. The staff recommends approval of both these changes. All right. Answer any questions. Thank you. So the first item is the A-frame change, and then next is the signage on a building based on the, the frontage space. Okay. Anyone for the public on this item? No, ma'am. I already asked that. Um, this is our public hearing. Any discussion during the public hearing from council? Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Richard, the A-frame signs, the, the, the purpose of those signs is not changing at all, just the location. So they still can't be directional signs, is that correct? Uh, Mayor Slum, Vice Mayor Archambault, that's correct. The purpose is not changing. Do you think the, the committee look at the fact that if they eliminate them, especially if you use the particular one that you, that you demonstrated, that if you eliminate that 20-foot res restriction, they may start becoming directional signs? Um, Mayor Slum, uh, Vice Mayor Archambault, I do not recall whether the committee specifically addressed that issue. Okay. I don't believe they did. The reason I'm bringing that up is uh, most of the most of the businesses that we're aware of here in Fountain Hills pretty much, you know, in, in the one that was that was 
predominant to us was the hair hut. You know, Jerry sits way back there, and certainly we want to be able to allow him to put his sign out towards the front of that that uh, green area that they've got there to to uh, let people know this is this is where he's located at. And I would just caution that we be careful that we don't start going backwards and getting into directional signs again. And I, I'm not necessarily in uh, against this particular design change, I'm just cautioning staff that we got to be careful that we don't start seeing directional signs again. And then we have what we had what was that 2003 when we started talking about sign ordinances. Yeah. So, That's okay. Very good point. Thank you. <laughs> the um, fact that um, we're now we're not allowing off-premise signage. That's probably the biggest uh, the biggest problem we had is there was that cottage industry of people putting up 30 signs per business around town all over and then also people were placing things in the right of way and in boulevards and in medians and, and on sidewalks themselves where they can't be. So they weren't being placed in the right spot either. But more visibility certainly through even through A frames seems to benefit the businesses from the businesses feedback we've had. So we want to do everything we can there but still maintain our beautiful community. Councilmember Contino. Thank you, Mayor. Uh Richard, I, I didn't hear everything Mike or Councilman Oshambo was saying that, Vice Mayor Oshambo. Call him uh, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we're not going to change the A-frames. They're still going to be able to sit out there. Uh, Mayor Schlum and Council Member Contino, this actually expands the use, the rules for the use of A-frame signage. Okay, because what we have is we have a lot of places that have more than what we're talking about at Plaza Fountainside. In other words, they've got the same problem. It's more than 20 feet from their front door out to the street. So are we looking at everything in Fountain Hills? Yep. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Very good. Councilmember Hanson? Um, Richard, could you address the need for the termination date of 1231-09 for the A-frame, um, allowing the A-frames? Mayor Sloan, Councilmember Hanson, I believe that that was something that the, the council put in place to see uh, if uh, to, to take a look at the town at that point in time and see if the businesses were using the rules responsibly and to take a look at the community and see if if um, it was if, the, if there wasn't a lot of sign clutter if everything looked acceptable then the council would need to act before that deadline to extend the regulations or make adjustments if necessary uh, to to allow things to carry forward if if the reverse is true that uh, the majority of the council feels that uh, the appearance of the town is unacceptable based on the proliferation of A-free signage, then you would allow the ordinance to, you wouldn't make any changes, and it would automatically, the permissions would automatically expire, and there would not be any frame signs allowed. Okay, thanks. Vice, I'm sorry, former vice mayor. Okay. Council member okay. Leger. You kicked me off. Um, thank you, Mayor. Along the lines of, um, uh, Councilperson Hansen's observation, um, I was kind of going to, I was going kind of in the same direction. In reading the staff report, page two of three, the next to last paragraph, it says, it doesn't say, it states, business related A-frame signs will not be permitted after December 31st, 2009. And I believe that's what she's referring to is that kind of termination clause in there. Um, I recall at the time that we developed this, um, whole um, new, new, new process and, and, and revisions in the ordinance that what we were looking for was uh, a year time period to evaluate it. Now that we've kind of come full circle and we've, we're amending the ordinance, it would make sense to me and, and I'm not sure if this needs to be a recommendation um, uh, or an amendment that we extend that to June 30th, 2010 to give that one window of that one year window for for practice because in essence the first time we did this we were looking at a one year uh, envelope here we're you know we only have six months and then it, it terminates so just uh, food for thought yeah I think that's something we'll need to address because we do not want to wait till December to make that decision so to, and that, that would cover um, the entire ordinance yeah, that, that relates to A-frame. So I don't think we can change that date tonight, but we could either talk about extending it, removing it um, at a future meeting. Any other comments on during this uh, public hearing? 
So, excuse me, Mayor. Yep. So what what I'm hearing you say, and and I need some type of rationale. Why is it we cannot amend that that date? I think right now, well, I could ask Andrew if I, assume, is it outside I assumed his answer was going to be it's outside of that. Oh, it's outside the scope of the agenda. That's what I was. Okay, very good. I understand. I Thank you. Save us a couple dollars by answering. Thank you. Plain attorney. <laughs> now you cost us. Green, that's that green stuff. All right, move on from the public hearing and go to uh, item number eight, consideration of ordinance 0906 as just presented. Can we get a motion? Here. Council Member Hansen. I originally brought the 20-foot issue up at the November 20th meeting after going out on the avenue and out on Suaro and measuring the distances. And when, after the discussion that night, when we left, um, I, I had the understanding that that would be something that we could come back and tweak. And that being said, I think it's time to tweak it. So I'd like to move that we approve Ordinance 0906, amending the Town of Fountain Hill Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 6, Sign Regulation, Sections 6008 to eliminate the requirement that an A-frame sign be located within 20 feet of the main building entrance and to increase the signage allowance for large commercial buildings. And we have a second. Second. One item, a question just to make, just ensure this still will require them to be on the property. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other discussion on this item? No. Um, Council Member Dickey? Nothing in this changed anything to do with banners, did it? This is all just a... A frame. Just okay. a frame. So the, the the signage you alluded to that changed to allow larger signage was not banners? No. Okay. Thank you. Good. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7-0. Thank you, Richard. Next item, consideration of renewing the annual landscape contract with Mariposa Landscape Arizona, Inc. in the amount of 134839 Welcome, Don. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm here this evening uh, to recommend um, consideration for the renewal of the annual landscape contract with Mariposa for $134,839. And uh, basically what I want to do is just go over the staff summary with you, and then I'll respond to any questions you may have. Um, in, the, in the summary, it says uh, the current annual landscape contract um, provide services for the town's parks and public works medians and the school district. The original contract was approved on June 16, 2005 and is renewal, renewable for up to four years for a total of five years with an annual adjustment based on the consumer price index. Uh, this year, the Mariposa landscape contract uh, has agreed to both reduce the scope of work uh, by reducing mowings and eliminating some of the overseeding in some of the parks. And um, we've also was able to get the regional operations uh, manager to agree to uh, not um, um, add the consumer price index in this year. Uh, also, um, he's, he's also, um, excuse me, this is the final year of the renewal and the work will be re bid in 2010. Uh, closing in those statements is that the schools district is not included in the uh, renewal this year and will be making their own arrangements with Mariposa uh, separately as required by the finance department. So with that being said, if you have any questions uh, in regards to the annual landscape contract, I'd be willing to answer. Very good. Thank you very much. Anyone from the public on this item? No, Mayor. All right. Anyone want to make a motion or a question with Kyle? Council Member Hanson? Mayor, I um I move to accept the annual landscape contract with Mariposa Landscape Arizona, Inc. in the amount of 1,340, 1,300, <laughs> <laughs> all right, One, I didn't have dinner tonight, I'm really hungry, $134,839 and saving the town $104,300, good job. Yes, second. All right, any discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7-0. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Thank Item you. number 10, consideration of renewing the Nichols and Sons landscape maintenance contract for fiscal year 09-10 in the amount of 155-466-07. Welcome, Tom. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this item is a request to approve the, the expenditure, as you just stated. Um, this is for the maintenance of town-owned medians and as well as town-owned property uh, around the uh, town center here. 
the this contract contains three items basically uh, we have the crew hours which is uh, the crew rate is for three persons and that we reduced the hours this year from 3,335 down to 2,000 hours. Basically, that just gives you one crew instead of one and a half. That amount was $113,800. We have the pre and the pomer, pre and post emergent spraying for weed control, uh, which was 25,147,000, ,000, and that covers about 56 acres of uh, medians that we spray twice a year. Also, we have an irrigation tech hours at uh, $16,519, which involves two people for the tech hours. Um, this contract is uh, savings this year is about seven, a little over $70,000 uh, from last year. Our contract is the same as Don's in that um, this is the last year on this. We will be going out to bid next year uh, for, for this, this work. Um, we have been satisfied with the performance of Nichols Landscaping in the past years and recommends continuing this contract for another year. Uh, in your packet, you also had a landscape maintenance map and the renewal letter um, was in there as well. So staff would recommend a renewal of the annual landscape maintenance contract to Nichols and Sons in the amount of $155,466.07. I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Anyone from the public on this, Beth? This no, here. All right. Any questions for staff council? Uh, Mayor, if I could, I would like to um, just comment that one of the advantages of having our program budgeting is we will be rebidding both of those contracts next year, and the town will be able to bid as well to see if the town can do it cheaper because now we have the ability to be able to capture all those costs for median maintenance or parks maintenance. So we're looking forward to putting in a bid as well to see if we can do it cheaper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Yes, Councilmember Leger. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a question for Andrew. It's my understanding that um, Nichols and Son is uh, on the market. They're, they're for sale. So if we engage in this contract, um, does, does that go with the sale or will we then be renegotiating with a new owner? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Leger, we, we don't have a specific provision in our contract for what happens if it's, the company is acquired, but our past history has been that as long as the new company is willing to be obligated the same way as Nichols and Son is, and if they are of equal uh, skill and, and able to provide the, the labor necessary to get the job done, we typically allow for an assignment that would uh, be authorized by the town manager. Thank you. Any other questions? I look for a motion. Motion to approve renewal of the annual landscape maintenance contract with Nichols and Sons, the amount of $155,466, and don't forget seven cents. So moved. Second. All right. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Mayor 7 0. Thank you. All right. Item 11 consideration of the option and lease agreement between the town and Cricket Communications. Julie? Mayor, members of the council, at the last council meeting, the town council approved a special use permit for Cricket for a light tower in Desert Vista Park. Um, since that is town property and they want to put a um, cell tower there, the town um, entered into a lease agreement or would enter into a lease agreement so we would get some rental revenue from that tower every month. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions for staff? Anyone from the public on this side? No, Mayor. All right, and look for a motion to approve option and lease agreement between the Town of Fountain Hills and Cricket Communication, Inc. Mayor, I move to approve the option and the lease agreement between the Town of Fountain Hills and Cricket Communication, Inc. All right, do we have a second? Second. All right, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7-0. Thank you. Next item 12, consideration of resolution 2009-05 amending the town financial policy section 3 fund balance establishing a rainy day fund. Julie? Thank you, Mayor. Um, during the Town Council's retreat at the goal setting session, one of the goals was to restructure the town's financial policies for fiscal efficiency for the benefit of taxpayers, and that was to provide for um, structural stability to the town's finances in the event of an economic downturn similar to what we're um, experiencing now. 
So basically what um, we have done is we've reclassified a portion of our fund balance and called it a rainy day fund. It functions pretty much the same as it, as it did before when we called it the undesignated unreserved, but now it's going to be a rainy day fund with a little more um, restrictions on the use of it and how it's to be used. Thank you. Would you be able to explain the, um, the ability to tap into rainy day funds generally, what the requirements are? Um, certainly, Mayor. Thank you. Basically, what the requirements would be is that rainy day fund would be set aside in a separate segregated fund, and it would be actually appropriated every year, meaning it would be included in the budget as an expenditure, but the restrictions on it are such that there are criteria that must be met before those funds could actually be tapped. Specifically, one of those restrictions would be that the um, you could withdraw from it if we lost 25% um, or more of state shared revenues, and that's equivalent of about one and a half million dollars. Um, the other restriction would be that um, it would require two-thirds of a majority of a vote to use it, and that um, if the town's revenues, total revenues in the general fund dropped more than 25%, that that could be used as well. And then and there's also a requirement to pay it back in five equal installments and contribute to it um, every year until it reaches a certain point. All right, good, thank you. Anyone from the public on this item? No, Mayor. All right, any questions for staff? Council Member Dickey. Thank you, a couple of things. Um, the the uh, having it go into the rainy day fund before transfers to capital projects fund, is that what we do now? To the, uh, the name of the other one that <laughs> Undesignated unreserved fund balance. Uh, Mayor, Councilperson Dickey, no, actually, we the undesignated unreserves we don't contribute to it every year. It has remained at a level amount every year, so we've not contributed. So we've taken any reserves left over from the general fund. They uh, have all gone over to the capital projects fund. Now we will take five percent of those reserves if there are any left, and put it in the rainy day fund first, and then the balance, if there is any, would go into the capital projects fund. Okay, um, Mayor, I wanted to just kind of think a little bit about that because obviously we talk a lot about our capital funds and how we don't have a lot of carry forward, and so this is this is pretty restrictive to take it before that. Uh, when we were talking about the way the budget's been going recently, I almost was going to suggest that we because we give 85% to that and 15% of our, any kind of carry forward. I was almost going to say maybe we start looking at changing that that percentage a little bit. So um, I was curious if anybody else had any thoughts about that, given the situation of our roads and the other items that we've spoken about and our lack of carry forwards for capital funds and if that was something that we, we could discuss. We could discuss that. Meaning increasing from 85 to oh higher no no percent. um just that do we want to do we want to put the money into the rainy day fund before we do the transfer into capital funds projects and we can talk about the percentage at a different meeting if needed because this is diverting some money from going into the capital carry forward what would that impact be the, do you suspect this year what would that impact be. I know it's a uh, Mayor <laughs> Council, um, I don't expect anything yeah, this year. Sure. But if I could, um, first of all, we would only be taking 5% of the reserves. And then once the rainy day fund was, it's maxed at 10% of the general fund revenue. So in other words, once we hit that 10% mark of about $1.6 million, we would no longer contribute to it. Okay. It, would, it would stay at that level. Okay. Um, the other, a couple other things, the uh, two-thirds is, Four anyway, right? So it's basically, we're saying a majority of everybody, not just who's here. So, like, if we only had five members here, it would still need a vote of four. So that, right? Is that what we're saying? Okay. Our attorney says, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then the equal annual installments that we have to repay and take not more than five years. I thought I read somewhere where we would replenish only in those years where it was, you know, like if we had five bad years in a row, um, I thought I had read that we wouldn't have to replenish, but this, then this part, this page four, makes it sound like it's, it's a mandate to replenish it within five years. So is that not 
Am I reading something wrong here then? Uh, um, I, I think you're understanding it correctly. It, we would, it would actually have to be appropriated. If we withdrew the funds, it would have to be appropriated every year for five years. The withdrawal restricts that you can't withdraw more than 50% of it. So you withdraw 50%, then you would have five years and you would have to appropriate it in the general fund. It would be a, a line item. Regardless and, of the economy, in other words. Because I, I don't know why I thought I saw it in some of the background material, but I guess I didn't print that out where it said you wouldn't have to replenish during times of, of another, uh, if you, you know, if you had several years in a row that weren't very good. Um, Mayor, Councilperson Dickey, yes, exactly in the, um, when we talked about the criteria at the beginning when we described a good rainy day fund, I think where you're reading from it said that the rules that do not require that the fund be replenished during a downtime. So um, that's probably a decision that we could make at the time. Okay. Um, all right, I think that's it then. Thank you. So with that last item that Councilmember Dickey brought up, does that cause some, cons uh, do we need to consider the resolution itself or is that something that could be managed or is it already contained in there? Um, Mayor Slim, it's actually not included. It, it was a sort of a statement that a description of a rainy day fund should include this. We didn't include it in that. We included that there would be a replenishment requirement. So if we wanted to not have to replenish it, we would have to change the policy. Mm -hmm. The way the policy is now, it says that we it is to be appropriated and, and paid back. Okay. Well, let's see where it goes here. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've been on the end of the council where we were struggling to look for funds, and I think that uh, this is a small percentage I think the Senate day is a rainy day fund. And I've been talking about this for probably the last, you know, six or seven years to Julie and uh, to the town manager. Um, I don't have any heartburn over, you know, five years is a long time, and usually somewhere in that period can come up with the funding to replenish that fund that gives us that safety net if um, uh, uh, entities beyond our control start start messing with our uh, revenue, and I think uh, you know the council is going to have to take that two thirds vote, uh, uh, you know, to to move those funds, and, and when we get to that situation, it's going to be serious, and I doubt we're going to have a a uh, three four vote. I'm I'm almost certain it's going to be more of a seven zero vote. Um, and it also, I don't know if it helps our, we're not really affecting our rating as far as our bond rating goes, are we, Julie? Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, no, that's exactly the intent of it, that we're not changing our fund balance, that requirement. We're just reclassifying it. So it actually would improve our um, credit with the Moody's because it is more restrictive. Thank you. So I'm perfectly comfortable with what we've got now. Thank you. And I think it's, self, it's a self-healing issue if we're, having trouble but we're, we're having to pay back. I think it'd be that emergency measure would be breached if we had to pay back money we really didn't have, have, couldn't afford. We'd be taking it right back out, I would assume. You know, I think it, it might just take care of itself in a crazy way, but yeah, exactly. Any other questions or comments before we look for a motion? Does anybody have the language up here? Mayor, I move to approve resolution 2009-05, amending the financial policies and establishing a rainy day fund. Second. All right. All in fa are any other discussion? All in favor and keep it saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7-0. Thanks for working on that, getting that put together. All right. Next item, consideration of resolution 2009-22, a transit service agreement between the town and the, and the RPTA of Maricopa County relative to reimbursement for the cost to provide ADA paratransit services for the period from July 107 through Jul June 30, 2012. Julie. Um, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. This is the um, intergovernmental agreement with the Regional Public Transportation Authority to give us the ability to apply for a refund of monies paid for the STS program. Good. Anyone from the public here? No, Mayor. All right. Any questions from or comments from Council? Yeah. All right. How did this come up? How did this get uncovered? Who came up with the, this idea? 
Uh, Mayor, members of the council, we were actually contacted by the RPTA and had they had originally forwarded this inter government agreement to the town over a year ago, but somehow it never showed up anywhere, and so they were calling to ask about why we didn't sign it, that we had an opportunity to, you know, get a uh, $7,000 $7, dollar refund. And so we can all, they also said we can make it retroactive to 0708, so we can go back to prior year, this year, and the next year, and apply for these refunds. I'll have to send them flowers. Council Member Dickey. That's kind of my question. Why isn't it for the whole amount, the 14,008? whatever it would be. Um, Mayor, Councilperson Dickey, this was the amount that RPTA has said that we're eligible to, to get as a refund. This, this isn't LTAF. I was just asking because we've got two problem. years here. we got 0708 is 7300 oh. and 0809 is 7500. It would be $14,000 if we apply for each year, if we get it. So the first year we'll get the 7000 and then we'll apply for the current year that we're in now, and then we'll apply for 0910. We have to spend it first. So next year we have to spend it before we can apply for the refund. So the fiscal impact would be double, I guess, what it reads on our report. You're correct. Council Member Dickey, what you're okay. stating. It would be 15000 Sorry. And then there'll be more next year, this fiscal if year. We, if we well. spend it, yes. All right. Council Member Contino. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Julie, can you tell me if we go with this system, there won't be any delay, so starting July 1, we'll start? Now, I'm, I'm only saying that when people are counting on going someplace and doing something. I think that one we're going to know more of on July 2nd. Okay. This one is to get money reimbursed to us that we're due because of spending money okay. in a certain area. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions or comments? All right, look for a motion here to approve transit service agreement with the Regional Public Transportation Authority for the period July 1, 07 through June 30, 2012. So moved. Wait, second. 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 Any other comments? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 7 zero. <coughs> All right. Next item, 14, discussion with possible direction to staff regarding putting before the voters the question of authorizing approximately $4.5 million in street and highway improvement and general obligation bonds to be held in November 2009. Julie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have four slides here with some brief information for the council just to, um, if there was any questions before we, um, to talk about if we wanted to put to the, to the voters the question of the bonds. Um, tonight's meeting isn't to actually ask that question, but it, I, an opportunity for the council to um, ask staff any questions about the impact of that. So I've just got like four slides. I'm happy to go through them. Um, let me know if you have any more questions. On the timetable, we have to call the election. If we're going to have an election, we have to call it in July. The date of the election is November 2009. If we had a bond sale, that sale would be about February 2010. We uh, uh, anticipate that the construction would start between March and June. The actual tax levy for the first payment, meaning the first time that it showed up on the property owner's tax bill, would be in August of 2010. And I'm sorry, we would levy it in August of 2010, and it would be on the property tax bill in September of 2010. If the, um, there's three options for funding this four and a half million dollars. Option number one is to do all general obligation bonds. Option number two is to do a combination of general obligation and HERF or highway user bonds. And option number three is to use cash and or combination of GO and or HERF bonds. Using option number one, using all general obligation bonds for a four and a half million dollar proceeds, the property tax rate is about seven cents per hundred, which is about $31 per year. And that's for a 15 year um, debt retirement on a $350,000 assessed value home. And these numbers are approximate. The assessed value is not finalized yet, and so it's, it's an estimate, hopefully pretty close. Option number two is using three million of general obligation bonds and one and a half million of HERF or street bonds, and that would be about five cents per hundred on a property tax um, of the property of the levy, about fourteen dollars a year on a three hundred fifty thousand dollar home, using the other million and a half from HERF, which is our HERF revenues, there's no effect on a taxpayer's property tax bill. The payment for that would come right out of the HERF revenues. 
And then option number three, same scenario, except that we would use the million dollars of cash from the capital projects fund, and that would reduce the general obligation bond down to $2 million, and it would be about $6 per year for the homeowner. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from the council. Anyone from the public on this? Side? No, Mayor. On option one, Julie, the um, why would the HERF not be included in there, or is it? Um, Mayor, members of council, option one is just if the council decided to do all general obligation bond and just have it all paid for through property taxes. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Dickey. Oh, Mayor, thank you. Are they all 15-year terms? Yes. 15 years. So then if you'll, so option two is a better rate or whatever than option one would be as far as what you're getting for your taxpayer dollars, it just from just from a quick look-see. Because if it's $31 a year for $4.5 million, but it's only $14 a year for $3 million. So it seems like there's a better, I mean, I know you said that these are approximate, but it does, if it's the same period of time and it's the same value for the home, it appears to be a better rate. Approximate is a good word. <laughs> okay. But yes, it is, they're all based on the 15-year amortization. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Julie, could, uh, thank you, Mayor. Julie, could you tell me what uh, reduction in HERF money we would have, we would see at the road department or the street department to pay those bond obligation off if we went to 1.5 million in HERF bonds? Currently, the HERF fund or the streets fund has a debt payment of about $135,000. It varies between 135000 to 150 and has had for the past 15 years. This year that's coming up is the last year. So this payment would be about $150,000 a year. It would just replace that payment. So there would be no impact other than the $150,000. And I guess maybe this is a question for Tom. Tom, you know, we're all, you and I talk all the time about the roads and road maintenance and how to keep them up to 70% level and stuff. And wouldn't, would we be shooting ourselves in the foot by using HERF funds when we could use them to, to maybe mitigate future bond issues that we might have to have by keeping up with the road maintenance and add that $150,000 to our road maintenance instead of using it for bond payment? Uh, Mayor and Council. That's assuming that we're going to get the $450,000 or $4.5 million from, from the voters if we went um, that route. Well, Mayor and Council, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. I mean, that's a decision that, you know, um, obviously, any extra money we can get for for road maintenance is much appreciated, and um, the the hundred and fifty thousand, I guess um, I, I can't figure that out percentage wise in my head that it would add every year, but um, certainly, you know that's that's a benefit. Um, we it doesn't it would it would probably um, help us get around the town faster. I, I don't. No, other than that. Well, we're always talking about slurry sealing and, uh, and you know, main, maintaining the streets. And I know that this year we put off some slurry sealing because we just didn't have the funding. Now, this year, had we had that $150,000 in HERF funds added back in and not had to use them for a bond payment, that would have maybe mitigated that what we had to put off or, or maybe even done more, more of the slurry seal or more street maintenance. So, and that, so that's where my question is kind of going. I'm wondering uh, if we're sugarcoating things by going to the, uh, by maybe proposing going to the public with, uh, you know, a smaller bond, general obligation bond, and saying, well, we'll, we'll use 1.5 uh, from the HERF funds, uh, and they're not really, they're not really seeing what it really, what it truly costs to to reduce the Warren Boulevard, which is what we're talking about here tonight, and and I'm wondering if we couldn't. You know, we saw a, what was it, a $14 million uh, expenditure that we're going to have to do on our streets by 2017. Um, I'm wondering if we can't, can't help ease some of that by, by instead of using the HERF funds uh, for a bond issue, but actually using it back on the streets to help mitigate maybe future years of going back to the citizens and saying we need another bond issue for the streets. Now it's Palisades, now it's Avenue of the Fountains, now it's, you know. I, I'm just trying to help 
in every way I can think of to add money back into our street maintenance so that we don't, because we're fighting a losing battle right now. Is that not true? Um, Mayor and Council, it is true. Um, this past year, um, we d just so happened that we were looking at the biggest zone that we have, and so um, we would have had a much more larger expenditure than what we had in previous years, and so that's why we decided to cut that zone in half and only spend half of the funds. Um, it would definitely, 150000 would definitely have helped us this year, but the reality is we still wouldn't have made it completely through that zone. Um, that zone would have been upwards of $900,000 to make it. But again, I, I do appreciate the, the thought of, of having extra money, certainly. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Councilmember Hanson. Thank you, Mayor. I think one thing we need to keep in mind during the discussion, though, I mean, what Mike said is, is well taken, but what is our best chance of having this pass? And I think if through this, it's kind of a participation. We're saying, okay, the taxpayers are participating, but the town is participating as well. And I think that might have a little edge over the first option. Councilman Lejay. Julie, <coughs> thank you for uh, providing us the options. I know when we discussed this in the uh, work study session, um, I was concerned about placing a tax burden, particularly on property tax, um, given the economic climate. And I know that um, we had talked about different options to take the, the burden off of the, uh, the taxpayers. And I think option two does that to a certain extent, and option three uh, does it to an a even larger extent. I guess um, given the whole economic climate and, hap and what's happening with state shared revenue, we're also developing a, a scenario that might be on a house of cards that we're, we're used to money for a lot of transportation needs and here we are looking at a debt whereby we would be depending on HERF and I'm concerned if things continue to trend the way they are from a state shared revenue perspective that um, we could find ourselves in a, in a, in a, in a not very, um, not 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 a, not a good posture, but I'd also like uh, my peers to consider something else here. Um, I think we really need to be sensitive to um, placing an increased burden on on taxpayers during this current economic climate. Um, I mean, this is the worst economic climate we've had in, in the history of uh, of this country. And although I believe that the work needs to be done, I'm just really sensitive to the timing. And more practically speaking, I think we also need to consider the fact that at our last council meeting, we talked about a possibility of the school going out for an, for an override uh, in, in November. So think about this. Here it is, November. Look at the economic climate. Look at the fact that school, if, if they're successful, typically trump other bonds. Um, not to mention the fact that we have a, a legislature and a governor that's talking about the possibility of pushing a, a sales tax or other property tax initiative onto the ballot. So visualize that, this economic downturn, people go to the ballot, you get school override, you get something regarding the state and we're asking for 4.5 million. I think the timing is, is bad and I think that the probability of our success, particularly at the 4.5, um, uh, the odds aren't, I don't think, think in our favor. So I agree the work needs to be done. I agree that we need to do a secondary property tax at some point in time. I just don't think this is the timing. And I am just not real confident if we go to the ballot on November 9th that we will be looking at success. And we will be spending $45,000 for the uh, election um, or if we pair with the school district, we can cut that in half. So. I know we're not making decisions tonight, but um, I'm, I'm just not really comfortable at this time in this economic climate of moving forward with this. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments? Member Dickey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think that partnering with the school district with our election uh, costs as well as with uh, our causes would be something that we could look at doing. I don't see what they're doing as, and I, I would not like to look at what they're doing as competition for us. I like to look at it as local control. I like to look at it as a 
electorate that sees a need, and if they don't, then we'll know that. I uh, I think 31, however close that is, $31 a year on a $350,000 home is something that we could consider going ahead with. And um, at this time, I'm comfortable with looking at either of those two options, one or two. But I'm, I'm comfortable with one. Uh, Council Member Contino. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, how much different would it be if we did this election in, what, May of 2010? I think we're required to do them in November. Sorry. Required in November? I believe so. Okay, so one year away, we're, how much are we looking at the difference of the deterioration? Hmm? Good Mayor and Council, um, that's an excellent question. I think, you know, we've, we've looked at, uh, You've heard me say that the drought has been with us for some time in the last two years. We've had more rainfall. So, you know, if Mother Nature continues to be nice to us or however she is, then it can, it can drastically affect the road, the roadway there. Um, you heard us talk tonight about, um, and, and I want to say this properly that it's, um, it, it could, it could lead into further structural damage of the road um, if, if we get larger sums of rainfall. So um, we'll, it's hard to say, you know, I, I don't know for sure. I can't give you an exact number or date or anything. We could always go back to the other option that we had that we talked about of doing one side of swore or one year and do another one on the other, another year. Thank you. Councilman Leger. Mayor, if I may, um, to, to Councilwoman Dickey's point, um, I'm not stating that we are or the school is in competition with us. I'm talking about this, the, the psychology of the voter that, that goes to the voting booth under the current economic climate. And as, as I, I recall, although it was a primary property tax, um, the amounts we were looking at were $4.5 million for um, public safety and um, which is pretty high on people's scale, and, and we all know what the results were there. And we were just starting to turn into the economic downturn when we looked at that vote, and then we heard a lot about the timing then, and I think the timing is, is you know, significantly uh, more dire, and we have data to that. The amount of the bond is, is really no different than what the voters, you know, turned down 80-20. Um, so once again, I, I, think it's, I think it's timing. I think that um, we, we really need to hunker down. I mean, there's just too many moving parts. Um, there's, you know, if we structure this thing on HERF, you know, that's a moving part. Um, not to mention the fact that um, a year or two from now, um, you know, we'll have uh, pr perhaps the Elman project in, in, in the pipeline and we'll have more property uh, sales tax dollars coming in. We'll be able to... Uh, uh, increase our, 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 our capital funds and um, maybe even take a closer look at that option number three, which reduces the tax burden even further, where it uh, goes for geo, herf, and cash for, for capital funds. So once again, it's, it's a project that needs to be done. Uh, I'm concerned about, about the timing. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Member Dickey. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate what you said about the psychology, and that's the way I meant it to be, that we're a community and that they see the needs. I think the roads are a pretty visible need, so it wasn't that I meant to imply you that we were against the school district. I was thinking of Fountain Hills as a community and that they may look at it as a joint effort to, uh, well, to continue for their override because theirs would not be a raise in tax, it would just be a continuation, and ours would, would address a need, and during the election for the property tax, some of the criticism was, well, this is continuous, so it would be 4.5 million every year, and what are you going to do with it? So there was that kind of distrust. This, if you would just ask us for one specific thing, we would give it more of a chance. So those were the kind of things that we heard. So I think this is pretty specific. It's very visible. It's, to me, taking charge of your community in a downturn. And, um, you know, I'm not saying $31 is nothing, but $31 a year um, probably wouldn't be a hardship for that many people. So I, again, would consider 
option one when we get down to this. So th I think that's what we're doing is kind of vesting, vetting what maybe could come back. So I wouldn't want to see that eliminated as an option. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've got to say that uh, I think that we're, we get elected because uh, the, the citizens don't want us to, sh and I used the word sherry coat earlier, sherry coat things to them, that they want us to do their business for them. And I think that um, uh, it would be irresponsible of us to not go forward with a bond issue, even if we, even if we feel it's going to get voted down, because by taking their vote away from them, we're already making the decision for them. I don't think that's what they want us to do. They didn't want to give us the property tax, that's okay, but but we didn't sure code anything when we went to them with the property tax. We said, here's, here's what it's going to take to stabilize our, our economy, our budget. We're starting to see ramifications of that now with the STS and who knows uh, what the legislature is going to pass on us. And had we had that stabilized uh, uh, property tax, we would be starting to see the revenues this fall. So, you know, I don't have a problem telling the voters, here's, here's the situation we got, uh, you know, here's where we have to get the money, and if we want to do option two or option one, you know, I, I don't think <coughs> it's fair for us to try to make that decision for the voters. I think we need to, we need to put it in front of them, let them turn it out if they want to turn it down. That's, that's their option. That's what, that's what the democratic process is all about. But I don't think it's my responsibility to, to pull things away from the voters so that they can't make a decision. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Hanson. I guess I kind of look at this. With the primary property tax, we're saying, give us the money. This one, we're saying, you want to join with us and pave Swarrow. So I, I, I agree with Ginny that it, it, it's definitely different. Um, we've heard a lot of citizens talk about ha being, having concerns over Swarrow Boulevard. And it just seems like an opportunity to just say, do you want to go forward with it now? If not, OK, we'll try it again later. But it's more just getting their opinion if they wanted to do it now. Yeah. Excellent. Any other comments? Thank you very much, Julie. Anything else you want to share with us on that item? No, thank you, Mayor. Oh, Mayor? Thank you much. Yes. Julie, do you need any more idea on how we're feeling about one, two, or three at this point? Um, Mayor, <coughs> Councilperson Cassie or Hanson, I guess you know we can prepare three options or the council can say, you know, I'm not sure how you want to get it on July 2nd when we have to call the vote. I don't know if when we call the election we have to say how we're going to do it. I mean, if we have to say it's going to be all a general obligation bond. We don't uh, have the ballot language, so it would have to be pretty sp specific, I would think. We have to have the ballot language by July 2nd? No, not July 2nd. Oh. In, towards the end of July, I think. 21st. Sorry. So, well, July 2nd, since we only have one meeting. Yeah, that'll be our last meeting, <laughs> potentially, yeah. until, unless you vote down the next item. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I think well, I, I didn't hear much in favor of three at this point, given that uh, our capital uh, fund is, is lower than we would like it right now. Um, and uh, item number one, uh, and item number two, utilizing the HERF monies is um, obligating it for something else for the next 15 years where it's been obligated before. So it's almost replacing what it's been doing. Um, um, but those funds are not assured either given the, the state of our state. Um, but I think uh, yeah, option two would probably be one we'd want to consider most closely from what I've been hearing here. Um, although several council members aren't afraid of option one either. Um, but I think if you weigh in the fact that this is an economic time we haven't seen in, in our town's history as far as the uh, global economy, um, maybe option two would be a more palatable to the, to the voters have more of a chance to pass um, and not be an overall uh, a lesser burden uh, dollar-wise to the citizens of our, of our uh, city here or town. Councilmember Brown? Uh, if the allergies don't kill me before we get through this, <laughs> I, I, I hear that option number one might be a, a quite viable option. I uh, have to agree with the vice mayor that having the uh, HERF fund left on the table to go ahead and continue the maintenance on the rest of the streets as we're, as we're working on Saguaro is, uh, I, I think, a, a good option that number one would, would outweigh number two. Now, that's my take on it. 
Yeah. Maybe we can expedite by saying, Julie, maybe prepare one and two. Yeah. <laughs> but I was going to read my mind. We're all on that page, I think. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks again. Thanks, Julie. Or Elena. Thank you. We'll see. Uh, next item 15 consideration of approving the cancellation of the Fountain Hills Town Council regular meeting scheduled for July 16th, 2009. So moved. Second. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, anybody from the public want to come no, out here? No, I hope not. All right. Yeah. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All right. Opposed? All right, uh, discuss with possible direction to the town manager, town attorney, and litigation council regarding the Fire Rocks tax litigation. Um, we have a motion on this item. Oh, I, I no well, thank you, <laughs> Council Member Hanson. Um, do we have a motion to move in the direction as discussed previously in the executive session? Yes, Mr. Mayor, we'll need a motion to direct all the folks that you listed there to proceed as recommended in the session. Thank you. Do we have a motion for that? Mayor, I move that uh, we direct uh, outside council, council, and the town manager to uh, move forward as discussed in executive session. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mayor 6-0. Thank you very much. Any items from our town manager, deputy town manager tonight? Um, thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Um, I understand that the next Council meeting on July 2nd, we will prepare two options for the Council to consider to put to the voters, one being um, all general obligation and the second option being general obligation and highway user revenue fund bonds. Good. Thank you. And item 19, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All right. Have a great <laughs> night. Thank you very much. I got a picture. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Oh yeah, we have a picture everybody.